A wonderful good morning to you all. We want to start, so I'd like to ask you to take your seats now. A very good morning to you. Now, yesterday was a very full day, a very intense day, but if one thing didn't get enough time and attention. It was a discussion with everyone in the auditorium. There wasn't enough time for discussion, and so we want to try to add time for discussion today, because I'm sure the crowd intelligence sitting in this room is amazing. You're all experts in the area of provenance research from whatever perspective you might be involved in it. And this is why we want to get a sense of your ideas, your impressions, and your comments. We're very pleased that the French ambassador is now going to speak to us. And after that, we would like to collect a few ideas, a few impressions, a few observations, but also questions you may have regarding yesterday and everything that's linked to the things we talked about yesterday. So just to collect a couple of these impressions and questions so that they can stay with us over the course of the day. And I promise you we're going to have regular slots where we will have a chance to discuss things. At this point, I once again want to thank our wonderful interpreters who really worked very, very hard. So, oh, blush. Thank you. And of course, the interpreters will be supporting us today, too. I would now like to give the floor to the French ambassador, Anne-Marie Descôtes, and she will give us a few words of welcome. Ambassador, we're very pleased that you're here with us today. Bienvenue. Mr. Vinand, Mr. Hüter, Professor Lupfer, Mr. Eisenstadt, survivors and their relations, descendants of victims of the Holocaust. Ladies and gentlemen, the cultural legacy is valuable for humankind. Our cultural legacy is part and parcel of what makes us human beings. And the General Declaration on Human Rights, which celebrates its 70th birthday in December, refers to this, giving people participation in cultural light. It talks about everyone having the right to take part in cultural life, to enjoy the arts, and to take part in scientific research and participate in the fruits of this research. But the cultural assets that we are discussing here is irreplaceable because it tells an intimate story of connection. The history of those who were deported by the Nazis, the families destroyed by the Nazis, because the appropriation of Jewish cultural goods was the first step towards deportation. And this is why this cultural property we're talking about here has a hugely emotional value as well. It is a symbol of a pain that cannot be put into words. Many families who are shaped by the horror of deportation, and for them, seeking for a painting or a book or an object objective art is part of the process of finding the shards of their family, tracing their descendants, and it's about creating a living remembrance that they can pass on to their family. I listened gratefully to the words of Mr. Lauda and Mr. Eisenstadt. The French government is aware that we have not done enough so far and that structural reforms are necessary. And this is why the French state is aiming to ensure that its policy in the area of provenance and restitution of stolen cultural assets 
from 1933 to 1945, we know we need to improve. The 20th anniversary of the Declaration of Washington poses the question of how we have used these last two decades. Learning from history has helped us to strengthen existing organizations and procedures. And this is why I'm grateful to the German Lost Art Foundation for organizing this conference on an issue that is so important for so many of us. In France, 20 years ago, the international context set out in the Washington principles ended up in a new policy of restitution, a policy that was late but proved to be effective. Today, more and more artworks are being returned to their rightful owners. In the last 10 years, particularly, we have seen a considerable increase, and this reflects the development of proactive research and an acceleration of restitution proceedings. But despite this significant improvement, the challenge facing us remains immense. In Germany, in the 1950s, restitution acts were put in place, including the Federal Indemnification Act and the Federal Act on Restitution. In France, on the other hand, it took a number of decades until a system for restitution of anti-Semitic appropriation that took place during the occupation time for these to come about, because the basis for a policy of restitution is the acknowledgement of the responsibility of the French state, which during the occupation period facilitated and allowed the atrocious acts committed by the Nazis. It was only on the 16th of June 1995 that France committed to this and acknowledged this when Jacques Chirac talked about this. He, he said, France has this day, it committed the irre irreparable, it broke its word and it delivered those under its protection to the Nazis, the executioners. And in doing this, Chirac admitted to a guilt that would never go away. And this was the basis of restitution. A study was published recently on the, this was the Mattioli Commission that commissioned a talk, a paper rather, on cultural assets and other property that were confiscated from Jews during the occupation by the Nazis. In addition, the French government also stated that hundreds of thousands of cultural objects and millions of books were appropriated from Jews. They set up an agency that looks at restitution claims from victims or their descendants. France followed this recommendation that came from this report in 1999. It set up the CAVS, the Commission for the Indemnification of Victims of Appropriation. Certainly, it was very late, but we can see results that have come from this policy today. First and foremost, because people of every nationality can place a restitution claim with this center. What's decisive is that the appropriation took place on French territory, and indeed 20% of the claims that have resulted in restitution since 1999 are not French, but live in other countries, primarily in Israel or the United States of America. In addition, we have to look at the scale of the work that this center has done and what it's trying to restitute, cultural assets, but also tangible and intangible assets, property, funds in banks, or property that was confiscated when the owners were in concentration camps or assembly camps. But we're just at the start of this work. We are nowhere near the end. Nearly 20 years since it was founded, 
the CIVS has examined 30,000 cases and over 500 million euros have been paid back in restitution. However, the cultural asset share of this is smaller. France had only about has only given back about 100 artworks. Without question, this is not enough. Even if during the liberation and directly after the war, a large number of artworks were indeed given back to their rightful owners. But today as well, there are countless works that were stolen from Jews that are still in museums being exhibited. And as a result of this, France wants to improve its restitution policy and has strength and wants to be more proactive and is more prepared to carry out more detailed research and the restitution that will follow from this. Searching for the provenance of cultural assets is an extremely difficult task because over time, the traces and the memories fade away, families lose contact with this past, and the centers who are carrying out provenance searches in many different countries are confronted with the challenges it entails every single day. Recently, in France, intense thought has been put around what to do with these obstacles, and we have thought about how we can support the responses and the approaches of the people involved in doing this. The first response that we have is to free up new resources and new funding to tackle this problem. In France, Prime Minister Edouard Philippe awarded the French restitution or gave the French restitutional policy a new impulse. This impulse is part of a major po political commitment calling to the state to do a better job. The premier minister followed by the cultural minister was following a new dynamic commitment to find stolen cultural assets and give it back to its rightful owners. But even if the restitution for disappropriation was, has been carried out as far as possible, the restitution of cultural assets has not been what it could have been, particularly artworks and books that are currently owned by public institutions. The government is therefore planning specific measures to carry out a more comprehensive restitution policy in view of confiscated cultural assets. The cultural ministry will be setting up a new center soon. Its job will be to seek for cultural assets that were confiscated and make it easier to find the rightful owners and give them back. So it's not a cultural legacy policy, and it's not about collection management. It's about ensuring restitution of artworks that are in our collections that shouldn't be, that got there unlawfully and that need to be given back to their rightful owners. And this connection and the, to give new impulses to the research on these new cultural assets, the Prime Minister has increased the scope of the CIVS and has set up an expert body within the cultural ministry specifically to deal with this issue. The mandate, its mandate will be to carry out provenance research and to return stolen works to their rightful owners. This authority will be focusing on identifying cultural assets and returning them back. The CIVS and this new center created in the ministry will be working together to work towards a more effective, more comprehensive restitutional work. All elements of research will therefore be brought together under one roof to harness synergy and increase efficiency. There will be only one decision-making body based in the executive, and that will be the prime minister. 
the majority of these cases come to the CIVS, which means that the procedures will be unified and the decisions will be made independently. Expanding the scope and upping the funding is a response to this challenge. The kind of cooperation between the stakeholders and the different countries also plays an important role, though. Today, we know that the restitution for cultural goods that were confiscated can only really be done effectively on an international level because it's not just the victims who are scattered across the globe, but also the artwork that was stolen from them and the archives as well. A number of players are involved in this process, researchers, institutions, archivists, curators, victims, and their advocates. And all of them need to work more closely together to join forces and pool resources, particularly knowledge in this area. The DZK in Germany and the CIVS, as well as the Cultural Ministry in France, have made progress here. And I'm pleased to be able to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that these three players will be entering into a cooperation agreement in the next few weeks, which will be signed soon. It envisages a five-year five -year partnership that will increase the efficacy of provenance research in Germany and in France. In addition, this agreement is in the spirit of the cooperation between German and French friendship. In this year where we are celebrating the centenary of the end of the First World War and in which we are enhancing German-France, German and French cooperation and friendship, this is very much along these lines. We need to also expand everything France does in this area. We need to do more to work closely with existing provenance researchers. We need to ensure that our dialogue with partners abroad, be they public sector or private sector, to make it easier for them to access our archives as well and therefore be a contact point for foreign researchers as well. Many of the works that were confiscated have now spread all over Europe and the rest of the world. And what this means is that France was a major location for looting and the art dealing dealers flourished and the art trade flourished during the occupation. This is why we need to expand what we do in this area. At the same time, we need to be ensure we need to ensure that we give researchers from all over the world the best possible conditions to work and exchange experience. We also need to develop an interdisciplinary research in history, law and art history. We need to foster this, fund this and accelerate the speed at which it achieves results. We can't just focus on the provenance of the works. We also need to know the details of the times. The archives that are hardly known need to be looked through, sifted through. We need to ensure that the mechanisms involved in the process are examined and we need to ensure that we can identify the competent stakeholders here. It's crucial, though, that this research take place on an international levels, like the National Institute for Art History in Paris and the Technical University in Berlin. And they have both been involved in identifying the protagonists in the art trade at the time. Exchanging methods and expertise is important. Publishing the report from Feldinsar and Benedict Savoie on the restitution of African artworks stolen in the colonial time could also be helpful in this context, too, for the French government. These two issues are very closely linked, but at the same time, they need to be seen separately. If we are to research each one, we need to ensure that we keep them separate. Every issue needs its own specific principles and methods, and they differ. So we need to avoid comparing these two in a way that dilutes history. Pavese once said, an Italian said, that we need to share common memories and find forgotten memories as well. 
So we need to ensure that we return these goods to the rightful owners because in doing so we are giving them back part of their personal wealth and their memory because giving something back like this is an amazing gesture, but it is only truly a successful one if it contributes to the reconstruction of the history of an artwork that was believed lost. Giving artworks back to the rightful owners can help heal the wounds and can create hope in a peaceful, common future. Thank you for your attention. The interpreters apologize that we didn't have that speech. So thank you very much indeed to Madame Decourt, the French ambassador. I had already told you that we would like to collect some of these questions which have arisen out of what we heard yesterday when we took stock of the situation, the impact of 20 years of the Washington principles and um, what sort of questions come out of that. I'm sure you'll have lots of them and we've got roving mics, so please just indicate you would like to take the floor and I'd be very happy if you get involved and I'm sure that there's going to be lots that people have wanted to say. Let's start right here. Please introduce yourself. Christoph Donier, Switzerland. In relation to yesterday, I think one question that, in relation, I've been working on some of these subjects, that's not become clear. Huh? That's not become clear, perhaps not sufficient enough. Accessibility to archives on a global scale is a measure for democracy. And I think that's where we really need to recognize that also in relation to what the American National Archives, with putting online Fold 3, and all of those papers, it has made an enormous impact on the way these data have become accessible. I think we ought to reflect that this is going to happen in all of the countries concerned. Accessibility is a measure for democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That also is something that the ambassador alluded to when she spoke about the uh, connectivity strategies all over Europe. But I'm um, sure the global connection is important here too. That's what we're going to talk about, networking connections and uh, strategies. I'm a researcher from Poland. Could you start again? Because you were um, not holding the mic. Could you, um, I am um, from Poland. I'm an independent uh, expert on uh, the theft of Jewish and Polish property. I've been active for 20 years in this uh, struggle uh, for the implementation of the Washington principles in Poland, and sadly, um, so far, this has not been successful. Let me, however, say that both Mr. Eisenstein and Mr. Lorde said rightly that uh, in Poland, um, nothing has been done to implement the Washington Principles. We've all heard yesterday that um, the various works of art that belong to the Mosse family, there are many of them still in Poland. And we also know that the first German restitution from the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation um, was a restitution to the great Hungarian, uh, actually, Breslau, uh, based collector Silberstein. We know that some Mosse, Silberberg, Nietzmann, Friedman, uh, objects have been housed in Polish museums now. And that is a matter where pressure can be brought to bear on the Polish government. It should be brought to bear. I mean, in the current situation in Poland, anything is almost hopeless. We don't need to uh, talk about this. But I still think that cooperation with Polish museums, archives, libraries should be considered. I think 
gradually the attitude, mentality, and the change uh, of generations should be used, and, and we might affect a change. And there is a second matter, something which has made me very sad for many years, is the fact that even in an event like this one yesterday, today, which is so important, 20 years after the Washington Principles, we're only talking about the Western collectors and the Western Holocaust victims. Nobody knows the name Zagas Wolz Barcios Krista. In Poland, there were at least 300,000 Polish Jews who weren't the Orthodox Jews that people always consider to be the stereotypical East European Jews. No, they were famous collectors. The name Menten was mentioned yesterday. From Poland, from Krakow, huge amounts of collections of Jewish artists were collected there. I can only ask you, since we have so many young provenance researchers here, look to the East as well, look in those archives, look for that stolen art as well, help us in Poland or help the Jewish heirs who are spread all over the world. They don't have this support. Thank you. Thank you very much for this important comment and uh, perhaps despite or even because of the current political situation in Poland, it's extremely important to look towards the East and support the people there and maybe even effect something in political terms. Right, another comment from the front? My name is Hartung, Hannes Hartung, I'm a Munich-based lawyer and together with Mr. Franz, whom I've known for a long time, we have been looking into um, uh, stolen art and I was the personal lawyer of Cornelius Gurlitz. We are hosting a conference called Ways into the Future and dear colleagues, let me remind you that in Germany we've already had two attempts aimed at improving the situation. The biggest problem we still have and I'm also uh, represent the Kretz collection, which I represent, so I'm on both sides, actually happier on this side. And the um, High Regional Court in Frankfurt says, I'm very sorry, we, we're deeply affected, but the Federal Council in Germany has been saying for years that we need a law which suspends or ends the statute of limitations for such crimes and nothing has happened. So I would have liked to ask Mrs. Grittis, who sadly isn't with us today, but my question is, when will we have a law which stops the statute of limitations here. The Minister of Justice in Germany has proposed a draft law which also allowed for restitution to be made, but then the government or the Minister of Finance said nobody could pay that. Dear colleagues, I think we would have a better and brighter future if we settle both the statute of limitations and the burden of proof issue. And another thing which is very important is a reappraisal of the provenance research. I think it is not acceptable that eminent researchers here work on a time-limited basis and in, with restrictions. Thank you. Another comment? Hello. Uh, my name is Mark Mazurowski, and um, I've been in uh, this, uh, uh, I don't even know how to call it. It feels a lot of times like a game, but most of the time it's just a thankless struggle since the very beginning and even before the Washington principles even became uh, a reality. So. The comment that I have to make about yesterday was uh, I didn't hear a single mention of the fact that fundamentally the Washington principles uphold the rights of the current possessors at the expense of the claimants because they were really drafted with a view towards making sure that museums and private uh, owners would be able to maintain their property in their hands and to try to figure out how to make claimants essentially go away in the name of some kind of illusory justice. So my question was, what would happen if you actually wrote the Washington Principles with giving, by giving equal parity to the claimant voice and to the victims of Nazi persecution? And I can promise you the results would have been very different. Thank you. Herr Eisenstadt würde gerne. That's a grossly inaccurate statement. I drafted these. They were drafted for just and fair solutions for the claimants. That was the purpose, and that's the spirit in which all the speakers yesterday, all the countries that are trying to comply are doing so. So it's just a gross misstatement of the purpose. There's no question about why we wrote it. There's no question about what the words meant. 
and there's no question about what the countries who are trying to comply are trying to do, including the French ambassador who just spoke and the German uh, who announced uh, 16,000 pieces have been restituted, the Austrians 30,000. We have many gaps to fill, many deficiencies, which I was candid in mentioning. But to grossly distort the basis on which we're working does a disservice to everyone. Thank you, Stuart Eisenstadt. Colette Avital would also like to take the floor. Um, following yesterday in the panel yesterday, I was wondering if there would be a possibility uh, to read out to this audience the Jerusalem Declaration, which I think is something that speaks a little bit about how we see the future. And if so, when would that opportunity be given to us? In Ordnung, ich danke Ihnen for the possibility today to talk about this. Um, bitte. Uh, hello, my name is Dosia Klinkenstein. Ich bin hier als Mitglied uh, des Kuratoriums. I'm a member of the um, DZK, the German Lost Arts Office. I agree with what our Polish researcher has just said, and I also know that what she said is uh, totally true. Still, I would like to ask a question to the organizers. The Washington uh, Declaration um, is very much linked to what Ms. Novika has said. Um, this is so much Western-oriented, but most of us uh, lived um, to the East, and nobody from there has been invited. You haven't got anybody from Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Romania. Today or yesterday, we haven't seen a single representative of any of these countries. I consider this to be a grave error. And I would have much preferred if we'd had a discussion with these people and those governments as well. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. We continue collecting questions and comments. My name is Gert-Jan van den Berg. Uh, I'm a, a restitution lawyer in Amsterdam for more than a decade. Um, a diplomat once told me that the Dutch are always right but never relevant. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know whether that is correct, uh, but the Dutch can be very direct. Um, let me first tell you um, that I am eternally grateful um, for what Ambassador Lauder and Ambassador Eisenstedt gave as a critical review yesterday. Um, I think that what they said is hugely important. Um, but what I missed uh, was the follow-up on uh, their review and critical remarks. Um, what I also missed um, was the perspective of the oftentimes frustrated claimants. Um, notwithstanding the Washington principles, they're often confronted uh, with block roads and indifference. Or as one claimant once said to me, the road to hell is paved with good conventions. Um, I also miss the international perspective. What should have been stressed is the double standards of uh, many countries uh, that uh, are signatory to the uh, Washington Principles. Uh, Italy is anxious to recover its own lost national cultural heritage. Um, yet it does absolutely nothing to uh, the victims of Nazi looted art. Russia is anxious to recover its own national lost cultural art, but it does absolutely nothing for the victims of Nazi looted art. In fact, it regards Nazi looted art often as Beutekunst, as, as uh, war trophies. I've had representatives of the Hermitage say to one of my clients, 
we'd rather burn your paintings than give them back to you. Poland was mentioned. They're very active in getting restitution of their own lost national cultural heritage. But what should be stressed is that a huge part of the collections of museums in Poland contain artifacts that originate from expropriated Jewish families. I also missed an opportunity to react directly to what Professor Bank, a former member of the Dutch Restitution Committee, said yesterday. I wanted to ask him how he thinks that he can reconcile the balance of interest test, which basically forces the Restitution Committee to take into account the importance of a work to a museum with the Washington principles. Ambassador Lauder made a very important remark in this respect, and Ambassador Eisenstadt did as well. I'm, I'm greatly thankful for him for that. The odd newspaper already covered this issue uh, in an online uh, article yesterday where it stated uh, the commission, re referring to the Dutch uh, Restitution Commission, takes into account the value of a work of art to its current holder, which many claimants consider unfair. I think that's an understatement. Excuse me, could you come Sure, to sure, my, 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 so my last remark, here. sure. My last remark is the following. Thank you. Um, the passage of time should be approached to the benefit of claimants, not to the benefit of museums. And if members of restitution committees don't understand that concept, where does it leave us, poor souls? Thank you. Thanks. So, here vorne Right here in the front, we have another question for the floor. I'm Afrahan Roth. I am also, I was born in Holland, and I very much agree with the speaker before about Holland, but this is not the question I want today to, to do. Um, uh, I just want to remark that the paragraph 9 of the Washington Declaration mentions that after some time, something has to be done about the art which has not found any hairs. I think 20 years later, we Holocaust survivors, <coughs> this will be one of our last performances here, and I think it's by time that the hairless art will be uh, decided about. It's obvious that 90% of all art in Germany, in France, in Holland, and any other country will never find any hairs. Uh, by the way, the cost in Holland to claim an hair, and also in Germany, you see, you heard the lawyers, you need at least two lawyers, and I do not know how many million dollars which will to make a claim. Uh, it's very easy. The, the last thing I want to say, and we heard it about France, it started in 95. 95, there were no survivors mean. Only survivors and families, grown up people, know what paintings they had and how it was. And maybe if you will allow me two minutes more, I was standing on a high bridge on the Heerengracht on the corner of the Amstel when the Haag police cordoned the orphan house in Amsterdam. They took away all the orphans, 74 orphans, and their assistants. The nurses, the doctors, they never came back, not one of them. Then after two, three hours, we saw, and I've seen it myself, how came Dutch forwarders together with German SS or Dutch SS, and they took out the complete furnishing and everything, everything that was in this house, and put it on boats and sent it to Germany. Now, my question is, how can anyone and I know there were very old paintings. It was a beautiful old synagogue where we used to go on Friday evening. How is it anybody that, that we can claim any of the paintings, any of the Judaica, as everything is lost, everybody has gone, and there is nobody more to claim? Thank you. Right. Do we have any other questions or okay. comments? Uh, 
Vincent Noss. Vincent Noss. I have a question for Mrs. Ambassador of France. Uh, voices were raised yesterday to press funds to start screening its own public collections, which no museum has done yet, uh, as other countries, uh, unlike other countries. Uh, Mrs. Ambassador, from your speech, can I understand? She isn't that here anymore. I'm sorry. Okay. To well. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. So, just l let me just tell that uh, France has been uh, working on the 2,000 works which are still uh, there and came back from Germany. And this is only just a couple of years ago, but has never made any inventory of its own public collections and uh, published the results. So the main problem in France, the main blockage is there. And uh, I was wishing that there would be some change from the new government, which is obviously has m more goodwill than before. And I was expecting her to answer my question, but okay, France is gone now. Unless, unless someone from the French delegation would like to answer. Do we still have a member of the French delegation with us? And if so, would anybody like to comment? It doesn't seem likely. Then one very last question here. Good, good morning. I'm Roger Strauch. I had a chance to address you yesterday. I'm the leader of the Masa Art Restitution Project. Three things. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, be with all of you today. I frankly see this as a tremendous networking opportunity to meet people who are interested uh, in the restitution process in which so many of us are participating. Uh, this has been a one to, this has been a wonderful moment to both celebrate and review the um, uh, Washington principles and think of how we might apply them constructively going forward. But most importantly, I'd like to offer a suggestion to all of us, which is in the future from this conference on, uh, and I'll be very specific, it may not be a bullseye, uh, that we meet twice a year for workshops or seminars or conferences on how to make claims, where the various custodians of potential artifacts come and tell us how they want to be approached and we learn how to uh, uh, put together the resources that, for example, I'm blessed to have in my project um, to constructively, expeditiously pursue claims in a way that is also efficient from the point of view of the, um, the current custodians of artifacts. So I, I think that might be an appropriate next step for this community to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. So that's basically the use of synergies. Right, now, sadly, we will have to close this uh, round, everyone, but we are going to set up more um, open slots where we can exchange views. Um, the roadmap for the future, how to approach the future, is something which we're going to deal with today, since yesterday we looked back. but. Um, Obviously, many of yesterday's uh, events has given rise to questions that we can address today. Uh, special aspects, um, networking digitization is to be considered, and uh, the uh, job of mediation as well. Provenance research has now reached into universities, as we know, art history has also been completely revamped. As far as research and digitization and current challenges are concerned, we will now hear from Leonard Weidinger, the historian, about this. He deals with the digital media in history. Since 2005, he has been researching provenance in the uh, Museum for Contemporary Art and Applied uh, Research in Vienna and has worked on digitization issues in a variety of projects. Welcome, Mr. Weidinger. Thank 
very important organizers of this conference, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for letting me come and speak to you today and for the warm words of introduction. I'm not speaking for the Provenance Research Working Group, who, which I led until, led until two weeks ago, but rather as one of many Provenance researchers. So, as we heard yesterday, I belong to these young people who wander around with the red button saying that they have a fixed-term contract. I'm not actually that young. And I'm not female, as so many are who work in provenance research. But I would like to say that we, who are wandering around here with these green buttons, whether we're younger or older, are the ones who create the basis of this work for us to be able to even discuss just and fair solutions. Unfortunately, the provenance research working group was not invited to come, but the new head elected two weeks ago also sends their best regards. And this brings me to my actual the subject I want to talk about. If I spontaneously ask colleagues from Provenance Research what kind of support they would like to see in the, from the digital world, what they often say is that it would be good to have a simple template in the Internet where you could just ask all the information that you need for your relevant case. So you see, this is the case that I have constructed. You may be familiar with it. And now let's look at our template. This is the template. Stick our question in there. And what happens next? Well, there's supposed to be an answer that comes out of it that is well structured and preferably has the form of a final report. Now, to make this possible, there would have to be a comprehensive database in which all of the artworks, all of the archival material, and all of the material published on the provenance were in there. Ideally, there'd be an encyclopedia as well, information about the institution, and it would be important to include all of the aspects that are there, stamps, art dealership, comments, ex libris, that sort of thing. All of that should be in there as well. And then we would ideally have a program that can deal with all of this, analyze it, and filter it. So we're looking for a egg-laying dairy milk pig, i.e. the hen that lays the golden egg, if you like it. And this super data platform is going to remain a dream just like that animal. But it, we do need to say that in 2018, we're not starting from scratch, but that many projects have indeed been realized. Cooperation has been set up. Experience has been gained. In the last 20 years, it's not just provenance research, which has become established as a scientific discipline. Parallel to that, digital technologies in the cultural sciences have made their mark, and in provenance research, too. Apart from the artworks themselves that the provenance research is looking at, i.e. from artworks to things from everyday life, there are also historical sources from which we gain knowledge. Digital technologies help us to capture the sources and make them accessible. Most of these sources were there for the documentation of objects, where they are, what status they're in. There are they're in auction catalogs, depot lists, other lists. Digital technologies help us to capture the sources and make them accessible. German sales is, for example, helpful that puts auction catalogs from 1900 to 1945 online. This is a very helpful project for provenance researchers, as you can imagine. 
Another project is the database for the central collecting point in Munich, which is available via the German Historical Museum website. Over 100,000 objects from June 1945 were pulled out of hundreds of repositories in southern Germany and Austria and brought to the central collecting point. And there, there was a system of index cards used to register them. The most important of these index cards, which is in Koblenz in the Federal Archive, were scanned in 2000 and nine are put online. This database remains essential for provenance research. But what we would like is that there be more options for researching here. We'd like to be able to look at the repositories where the objects came from to the central collecting point or objects that don't have an index card. It would be good to rework this database, and indeed this is planned. And this brings us to the second area in which digital technology can support provenance research, the analysis and evaluation of sources. Digital tools give us the opportunity on the basis of the sources we've captured and the information we've generated from it to reconstruct structures, to f assess networks, to visualize geographical movements, and many more besides. And this is where I see the real potential, the biggest potential, but also the biggest challenge. It cannot be the case that for every project there is an individual digital solution and countless standalone islands of information that are not in exchange with one another, or where it's very complicated to connect the dots. We need to ensure that the technical systems, but also the content-based structures of the individual projects be set up in accordance with common standards. So defining these common standards and establishing these standards is one of the biggest challenges for provenance research in the years to come. Hang on. Well, actually, that brings me to the culture of work in which we do this. This concept comes from the social sciences. When companies or organizations and the cultures in them, i.e. the structures in a company, that's what they really describe, whereas this concept looks at the level of working. So the practice of how work takes place, even though I'm not a sociologist, and this is a bit of me being a dilettant, but I do think that we need to restructure the way we work in provenance, because successively involving digitization is changing the way we work. And of course, we provenance researchers don't work in one company and have one corporate culture. We often work alone or in very small teams for individual clients, but what we do is very similar. It is our job to work out which objects were confiscated by the Nazis. And at the end of the day, most of us are paid for paid by taxpayers' money. That's the point of departure that we have. And this is why it would be very good for us to network and connect more. In fact, not doing so is actually a very bad thing. And the best example for connection and networking is the working group provenance research. In November 2004, provenance researchers Uta Hauk, Ilse von Samoon, Laura Stein, and Katja Taylor met. I think all four of them are here. They were meant to be here anyway. And they met in the Valrav Richard Museum to exchange ideas. And that was the setting up of this working group. The group started to meet every few months, colleagues joined them, but for a long time it wasn't such a big group. They would fit in any little meeting room. Communication was based on personal talks face-to-face, -face. and in the working group provenance research these remain important, even if we are now a registered association and have more than 270 members. And at this point, I would just like to interrupt for a moment. There are many members of the working group here, and you can recognize them with their green buttons. I'd like to ask all of the members of our working group provenance research to stand up. And now I would like to ask everyone who has a permanent contract to sit down. Those of you who have fixed-term contracts or somehow a short-term contract, please stand up.
remained standing. So you get a sense that not many people sit down, the structure doesn't change very much. And now I'd like to come back to a statement yesterday. The funding advisory board will have to process a lot of applications if they don't change their structure. But it would be really useful not to work on the project basis, but rather to expand the research structures. Long-term projects don't take a year or two. They take longer than that. All right, everyone can sit down if you haven't sat down yet. Thank you. So, even if we often meet in person for the working group because of our size, it has become crucial to have digital tools and to engage with how they work. Digital technologies are a crucial part of communicating in today's world. And of course, that's not just true for provenance researchers, I understand that. But this is the third area that is crucial, and this brings us to the working culture that we have. Those who work with digital technologies, like myself, have to be aware of the fact that it's not enough just to have technologically perfect online platforms in place. We also have to get all of the stakeholders involved to use these platforms, to integrate them in their own work patterns, and to provide data themselves. Digitization is only a question of technology to a certain extent. It's far more important that these new options be used as best as possible in the service of academic research. And this brings me to the end, to this magical beast. In another context, we provenance researchers sometimes feel like we are this egg-laying, wool-bearing, dairy milk pig. But let's just make it clear, it is not our job as provenance researchers whether an artifact should be given back or not. This lies in the responsibility of the current owner. And it is not our job to look for errors or to come up with expert reports. We can do it, but it is not our core business. Our job, in accordance with the Washington Principles, is to find the location of objects and their current ownership situation and to research where they are, what happened to them during the Nazi time, what's happened since 1945, to document all of this and to create a basis for a fair and just solution of these objects that have been confiscated. And we're happy to contribute our work in digital provenance research as best we can. Implementing the Washington principles properly can only be done with us, the provenance researchers, not without us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard Weidinger. Gentlemen, ladies, join me in welcoming Hermann Parzinger, who has been the president of the Cultural Heritage Foundation, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, since 28. And he's going to tell us how um, work in such a major institution has developed and how it has been impacted by the Washington principles and how that can be applied to other historical complexes. A very warm welcome to Hermann Patzinger. Ambassador Eisenstadt, ladies and gentlemen, my subject really uh, concerns what does it mean to work in such a major organization like the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation 20 years after the Washington Principles and what is the experience we can talk about uh, in practical terms and I'll talk also a little about how can we 
translate what we've learned into other areas. But first of all, let's talk about the experience and the knowledge we've got through 20 years of work with the Washington Principles. There are three main uh, pillars that fo we, we focus on. One is the, the search for works of art, then provenance research, and how do we deal with the results of provenance research, trying to find uh, just and fair solutions. And there's always a question we ask about mechanisms to achieve a settlement. First of all, seeking objects, provenance research. It's become crucial that we don't work on a case-related basis only. In other words, that uh, you have a claimant applying to the return of specific um, items and then reply to that, but we should check our own inventories. Many libraries and museums in Germany have done many such projects, and I consider it to be vitally important to systematically screen uh, an inventory. You have to do it in a, in a slightly systematic way, because maybe there is there are greater grounds for suspicion that there might be looted art in the inventory than in one place than in others. But, you know, it's not just uh, collections for the classical modernity um, issues, but, you know, ancient uh, artifacts or um, other collections can be just as important because they may have belonged to Jewish fellow citizens of days gone by who've been expropriated. But what is important is the methodology, because that's not so easy, especially when it's not about outstanding objects where it's easy to identify them, but we have the sort of run-of-the-mill collections. So that's much more difficult, and it is important that we are looking through the inventory, to graphics, to um, books, uh, everything, large-scale objects. The identity is much more difficult to find, that, especially when it comes to printed graphics. Titles aren't necessarily unequivocal. Often changes have been made, so it's very, very complex, and the provenance researchers find themselves facing major obstacles. That's an experience that is definitely shared by all of us. And here I'd like to pick up on what we heard yesterday. Complex provenance research is something which has um, accumulated knowledge increasingly. We've seen networks and new sources emerging, and that sort of knowledge can't be sort of learned from textbooks or at university lectures. It's experience gained by provenance researchers, and it's very important that they network more effectively and that they also work maybe a little bit quicker uh, but it's very important that we have a sustainable knowledge transfer and maintenance. That's very important for all of us. This working group on provenance research, we've just heard quite a bit about it, so I can cut what I'm saying uh, short. They started with four people, now we've got hundreds of researchers from all sorts of different disciplines and countries, and it's extremely important that we have provenance research really making progress. We can only hope that we do this with our Prussian cultural Heritage Foundation, we've now got the possibility of having some permanent jobs for provenance researchers. But uh, when we're looking at the whole museum and, and cultural institutional landscape, it's not always that good. And we need the provenance researchers, otherwise, we will lose knowledge that is so urgently necessary. We'll also hear the word PREP. This is the German American Provenance Research Exchange Program, which is an exchange program between Germany and the United States, where twice a year for the duration of one week, provenance researchers from Germany. Germany and the United States meet um, intermittently in one or the other country, and they have organized discussions, visits uh, through the Metropolitan, the Getty on the U.S. side in Germany. It's the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and the Central Archives for History of Arts in Munich and Dresden, as well as the Bavarian State Collection of Paintings. It's extremely important that this professional network and exchange of knowledge is really put on a sound basis. We now have 20 years' experience, and that has seen a lot of positive development. However, there is still a problem, namely that the involvement of private institutions and collections is still somewhat meager and highly desirable. And I'm not trying to generalize here. We have a lot of um, active um, people in the arts, trade, 
providing a lot of uh, support to us. Neumann's the auction house, like many others, doing a great deal here. But sadly, there are also others whose archives will be tremendously important in order to uh, really know something about the, the whole uh, provenance, the chains of previous owners, and they could be a great deal more prepared to share their knowledge with us. It also applies to private collecting archives. It applies to banks and their collections. Obviously, data privacy issues play into that. Personal data need to be protected. Still, despite all of that, it would be very important for all of us to have better cooperation. And without the involvement of such private individuals, and or institutions, provenance is often very difficult to establish. The names of individuals and institutions should be shared. There we need change. Often we um, invest money in provenance research in order to obtain information which may already have existed uh, and, and just not been shared with us. A second issue which has already been addressed is the question of good documentation. Indeed, there are many databases. I hesitate to call them data cemeteries, but we've got catalogs and databases on individual projects, individual museums. It would be nice to have a central research database, which, yes, some people are trying to set up. There's also the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Project, and they're following a similar approach. I think it's tremendously important that all this very dispersed information is bundled in one way or another. Obviously, there are very complex, expensive data migration programs. I'm hardly an expert on, on data races myself, but it has to be possible somehow, and we need to do it quickly before it gets even more complex and because we need to find the proper technological solutions so that we can use a portal or what have you in order to really access all this information. It has taken time until provenance research has really um, been properly anchored within most of our cultural institutions, which by now I think it, it has. But it's very important that young people coming from universities, starting to work with us, learn from the very beginning how important provenance research is, that it's one of the core jobs of looking after collections in museums, libraries, or wherever. That has to be made clear. But despite some positive trends, one does have the feeling that despite new chairs and provenance research being established at universities, uh, which it has at the Free University of Berlin, you have new professorships as well as in, in Bonn, Hamburg, Munich, but um, we need to have um, not a sort of um, aid to academia. It should be not a specialist um, exotic course, but it should be an integral part of the main study course, and the people who are trained in this area would then also um, find opportunities for making sure that there is a permanency given to the subject at universities and later. It's very important that we also sensitize the wider public for provenance research, very much in the context of the Nazi injustice. And I think people want to know more about this. And very often, people are very interested. We've just had the opening of the Bear Green um, exhibition in the Bear Green Museum, and I'd love to invite all of you to go there. Please don't miss your chance to see that exhibition. It's one way of um, ending a major three-year-long provenance research project. There's a publication that lists the results accompanied by an exhibition. It is not a uh, one uh, object um, among those shown that is the result of uh, expropriation through Nazi persecution, but it does illustrate the difficulties of provenance research, and it also tells us a great deal about networking connectivity of the uh, arts uh, dealers and traders in the first half of the 20th century in Europe that is very interesting and I think that sort of information must be driven more into the heart of the wider public. We also have some media stations which um, show people what the Mossel collection was and uh, which other collections there were. And I think um, making it possible to point at the provenance of objects and make clear what it means is one of the most important jobs that public cultural institutions have. Fair and just solutions. I think that was one of the very clever sentences, which is part of the Washington principles. But of course, the practical implementation is still a challenge. We do notice that as we move forward with provenance research and, and checking our own 
inventories, we find increasingly complex cases, particularly given the economic uh, crisis of 1929, then 1933. What happened to uh, cultural or art items before or post-1933? What was really due to persecution? What was just due to the economic hardships of the time? It's very difficult to find out. We've just started looking into is Dresdner Bank um, had various um, cultural objects that ended up in public um, institutions in the 1930s. So it's a big challenge for us to look into this and then to find what is truly a just and fair solutions. Now, we've heard various people discuss whether or not we need a law. Personally, I always thought, no, we don't need a law, really. The Washington principles are clear. And what we need is simply more provenance research, which would be the proper basis uh, for decisions. But now I don't know whether that is the right way into the future. It, it will need to be debated. I'm not sure anymore, but we'll need to discuss it because individual case is getting increasingly complex. Maybe it would be good in the interest of transparency if we had a firm underpinning in law. But there are other authorities. I mean, uh, for example, restitution isn't necessarily uh, exempt from customs. If something is uh, returned, then German customs will levy um, something on that. So we'll need maybe a law on that. The, the various alternative settlement systems, the Limbach Commission, the Advisory Commission, the people love criticizing it, only 15 cases in 15 years, but um, that doesn't mean that provenance research in Germany has been sitting back on its laurels. It simply means that in 15 years it was only necessary 15 times to call on the Advisory Commission. Improvements have been made on behalf of the Commissioner for Culture uh, and the Media in Germany, there are also members of the Jewish community which are represented on this advisory commission's board. We've heard that um, it's now possible uh, unilaterally to call on this advisory board, which I consider to be a very important step indeed. I've always said that this should be the case. I mean, we wouldn't have a problem with it if somebody comes to us. I mean, if, if there is a good case, uh, then nobody needs to be frightened of uh, applying to the Limbach Commission. So it's very important that it's now possible to do this unilaterally. What it means for the work at the advisory commission if they suddenly uh, get, get flooded with applications and how they work on, on all these claims which may uh, be entered, we'll have to wait and see. But here I get back to what I said earlier. Maybe here, too, um, a law would be sensible. After all, if you have courts, there is a different character to decisions, legally binding, chance for legal redress, all of these matters would matter. And I can tell you from my own experience, maybe that would make it unnecessary to call on American courts, which is one of the roads that people travel. So, I mean, I'm really looking ahead into the future. We need to watch and see what happens, what the impact is, and all the time think about what possible legal regulations might mean and whether or not a uh, regulatory approach is necessary necessary after all. Before I come to the end, let's talk about how we can translate our insights into practical systems. That's very difficult. There are many areas where provenance research has become increasingly important. For example, the injustice is committed by and in the GDR, East Germany, as well as we've been looking in the various um, issues concerning um, property and expropriation. It's also important for the colonial context, GDR on the one hand, but also the colonial issues. And the German uh, Lost Art Foundation is to set up specific uh, departments for that, which we welcome, but hopefully they're properly equipped so they can do a good job. However, it needs to be clear for us at all times that Nazi injustice and um, coming to terms with what that meant and trying to uh, compensate and restitute, that has to be our top priority. Now, when we're looking how the experience gained from dealing with Nazi looted art can benefit these other areas I mentioned, GDR colonialism, that, I think, highlights the importance of connectivity of networks, but any type of provenance research, not just regarding Nazi looted art, will benefit from having so much knowledge being kept that the researchers have gained. It must be kept available and accessible. Sources and results need to be made transparent. Here, again, when we're starting with the new areas, um, 
GDR colonial art, the question of databases, communication between databases, all of that needs to be settled from the very beginning so that in these new areas we won't have the same problems we've had to overcome with the Nazi looted art issues. And maybe when we take the reverse position, when people say maybe these new areas could also have benefit for the research of um, Nazi persecutees and the losses they sustained. I think for historical reasons it's, it's unthinkable to translate things from these new areas to, to the Oud. But let's get back to what the French ambassador said, because she referred to this uh, report which um, has been submitted to the French president since last Friday. I think something which we have learned from how to deal with the Nazi injustices and uh, with provenance research is despite the dimension of this crime, there isn't such a thing as just black or white. We can't black or white. We can't say right, wrong. No, we have to study each case very carefully and explore it. That is one of the insights we have gleaned from our work with um, Nazi stolen art, and that is something which can be applied to colonial stolen art as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hermann Patzinger. And now we look to Bavaria, where one of the three largest collections of art is headed by Bernhard Matz, who has headed the Bavarian State Painting Collections as Director General since 2015. And that means he's going to be telling us about his work there. A warm welcome for now. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, to talk about the provenance research in Bavaria, where, as you've heard, I had one of the third largest German art collections, the Bavarian State Painting Collections, cannot be done in 15 minutes. But I'm going to try and do it, even though I'm doomed to fail, and I know that, because there are just so many different facets. I've had to shorten my presentation. I've been in Munich for about four years now. I entered into a turbulent river, the river of provenance research, and I realized that I entered into this river where the river has a bend. And it is good that there is a bend here, because for a while, we had to rethink the methods and all the things that we do. But I didn't get into the river when it was at its source, and there's still a great deal left to do. So why are we focusing on this federal state, Bavaria, when there are so many others one could talk about? Munich, already in the 1920s, developed into a center of, of the rise of Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Movement, the Nazis, in the Hofgarten Arke Arkaden in 1937, a major propaganda exhibition on Entartete Kunst, degenerate art, was located here, and in the Bavarian hinterland were Nazi political centers until the end of the war, important nerve centers of the Nazi regime. The restitution of what is known as art stolen by the Nazis or looted art was an important issue for the Allies in the post-war period, in which from 1949 German authorities also participated in on both a federal state and a national level. Once again, Bavaria and the American occupied zones played an important role because in the zone they were responsible for, the Americans found considerably more confiscated and evacuated art and cultural artifacts than all of the other Western allies did together, including collections like that of Hermann Göring. Hitler's collection for the planned Führer Museum in Linz, which was supposed to be based on art primarily recovered in Austria, fell in the U.S. American zone of responsibility. 
and Mr. Weidinger also talked about this aspect, namely that the American military government brought these together in central collecting points, and the biggest of these central collecting points was in Munich. The artworks of the Pinakotheks that had been evacuated due to the war came back via the collecting point because only those artworks were given back to the museum for which it could be proven that they were not confiscated within the framework of persecution before 1945. And this also affected works that were acquired before 1933. So after after 1945, if it was not possible to find out about the origin, or if the objects could not be identified, or if the unlawful confiscation was unclear, they stayed with the Allies. So these were the most complicated cases. We have to do justice to the fact that they kept the most complicated cases. The Allies transferred responsibility for these cases successively from 1949 to German centers on a national and federal level or rather state and federal level. Some objects of art owned by functionaries and Nazi organizations were taken ownership of by Bavaria, and this was on the basis of allied directives after the 1950s if no restitution claims were found. These artworks were passed on by the state of Bavaria to other collections, including its state collections, i.e. my museum. The institutions that received these artworks received the collections, and after the deadlines for restitution claims, they dutifully entered them into their inventory at the end of the 1950s. So the assumption they were making at the time was that one had achieved a final legal situation, legal certainty. From today's perspective, it is a real shame that this whole theory of drawing a line under the past, I'm saying theory rather than debate, because it wasn't really a debate, no further efforts were made to find the original owners. However, the assertion that we keep hearing that millions of artworks confiscated by the Nazis are now found in German museums, I believe, is fully far-fetched. Let me tell you a bit of the experience that I have had since I've been there. We basically looked at the objects from the Linz collection, and in the two years that we carried out this work, headed by Birgit Schwarz, that we had six restitutions and 23 pieces that were in the lost art database. So this was really just a millionth, uh, or rather a thousandth of lost art restituted. And we have seen that this was something we saw with Gurlitt, and we cannot repeat this often enough. Because there are hundreds of works that we have to examine in terms of their provenance before you find one that you can restitute. And we like to do this. We're happy to do this. But that's where the response comes from. How? Why does it take so long? So here I'm speaking for the entire Bavarian research landscape. I'm going to show you a selection of publications that have been made in Bavaria on this subject. Just a minute. This is where I want to be at. So what you can see, if you just look at these five books, there is systematic research taking place, and Mr. Patzinger just talked about as well, proactively as well. We are not just responding to claims. We also reach out to heirs as soon as we have found the heirs of these artworks. And indeed, it is the case that whether we want to or not, we have to search for heirs, which can be incredibly complicated. We do it because there is no other structure and no one else is. So in the consortium, research consortium, Provenance Research Bavaria, established in 2015 by the Minister of Science and Art, 
13 museums, universities, archives, libraries, and institutes of the Free State of Bavaria have come together. Using this consortium, or the benefit of this consortium, is the exchange of information about victims, stakeholders, structures, contemporary research methods, and tools. It is supported by a digital research repository. Often, research projects that we have cover a number of institutions. I'm going to skip a few details and just say that the question of networking is absolutely essential for us. What is called for on a more global level is also true in the microcosm of the research consortium in Bavaria. What drives us is the thought of transparency. And this means that we need the books of access from inventory from 1933 and 1945. Very soon we will be publishing them on the website of the Research Consortium and the Bavarian State Painting Collection will be soon available online. Thank you. And part of this transparency is posting the online, posting online all of the existing arts owned by our museum with the last procurement state, the last purchasing state, not too soon, but as soon as we can, we will be expanding. As soon as we have the Museum Plus Clear, then we will have a provenance module which we will be incorporating. The same is true for the Bavarian National Museum as well as the Bavarian State Painting Collections. So posting these things online is a step to our final end. And thus, step by step, we are trying to fulfill the Washington principles. Every piece of art created before 1945 can now be examined in terms of whether or not it is in our collection or the Bavarian National Museum collection from wherever you are in the world. And you can see how the last, last step of acquiring it was. Another step of modifying our structure is making everything available in the arts. Mr. Petropoulos, many years ago, said thank you for getting these archives and found some very helpful information for provenance. This is good. We didn't have an archivist. Now we have one in the Capitals archive. And five days a week for eight hours, you can access them. What we have lost with the transfer of this data is direct access to the provenance researchers in our house. But those who research in the archives, I very much welcome to come and research in our museum. Exemplary of the activities in Bavaria are the exhibition Origin and Suspicion which has been, will be running until February 2019 in the Kulturspeicher Gallery in Würzburg, which in an exemplary manner does, manner does justice to these issues. The lives and fates of owners and dealers are described here. The complex work of provenance researchers, which often doesn't lead to a final answer, becomes something you can experience. And it becomes clear just how many cases remain unsolved despite efforts that are made. And these are cases where we don't necessarily even have a suspicion that there might have been Nazi confiscation behind this, where we simply don't know. It's worth emphasizing as well the initiative of the State Center for Non-State Museums and the Central Institute of Art History, because both are facing a task of Hercules, even though they have very little funding, the state, the Bavarian Center, has two positions funded by the German Lost Art Foundation for more than 1,000 non-state museums, and they have so far been looking for suspicious works. And you, you've heard a bit, or you may have read in the Süddeutsche paper 
about the Schaefer private collection, this is something that they're also looking at in their, with their provenance. The Central Institute for Art History in Bavaria for 10 years, in the last 10 years now, since 2008, has realized 16 research, access, and digitization projects primarily funded by the German Lost Art Foundation, the DZK. Now, after many years of efforts processing an eminently important art trade archive, that of Böhler, will finally start in 2019. Although the Central Institute, above and beyond the museums that it researches on, and we have to say researchers, uh, museums are places of research, although the Central Institute is the only research institute in Germany that has proven expertise in the area of provenance research and has a good network, Above and beyond the money available to the museum itself, there is no extra funding for this, which means the sustainability of this provenance competency is not insured at an institute which needs to have this kind of permanent support. Just a few weeks ago, Antoinette Maget Dominicé was hired as a junior professor for values of cultural properties and provenance research. And she will speak to us later on. She's at the Ludwig Maximilian Institute in Munich. She calls for a shift of the debate from the tangible to the intangible. I would also like to increase the number of professorships as well as the number of permanent jobs in provenance research. Perhaps you will allow me to look at the Kunsthalle. For time reasons, I won't be able to talk about it, or it won't get a chance to have its voice heard. If in 10 years we meet here again, I'm sure we will have new results, more results. We already have the Neumeister Auction House in Munich. Once again, it's Munich, which is a pioneer. It has been exemplary. It is the only art trade institute which has processed its and critically examined its history during the Nazi period. This is Michael Hopp, who has published work on this in the context of the publication. You, you will have seen her name. Since 1998, the institutions of the research consortium in Bavaria have been able to carry out 120 restitutions with far more artworks than that. Let me just ref describe to you the latest restitution in the Bavarian state painting collections in June 2018. It was a picture of Ernst Emanuel Müller entitled Bauernstube, Farmer's Parlor or Living Room. I'm sorry, I'm in it. It was given back to the representative of the Friedman family, the heirs in Augsburg. It was a touching moment, and the result was a very friendly connection. However, a journalist asked me in the context of the restitution of this work who Ernst Müller was and why, if a such low-value painting, the director general would bother to come to hand it back to the family because the value, the value of the work was so low. And this question is revealing, I think, because I believe it documents the misapprehension that even journalists have that in museums and ministries, in the case of restitution issues, it's about the financial value of these objects and not about the value in terms of memory or the social and moral mandate, even with a painting that costs as much as a second-hand car, it's still worth it to us because it's about these people and their history. We keep reading that the Gurlitt case has got provenance research in museums going. As we know, this is a falsification and a simplification because it didn't even create permanent positions for provenance research. But since the Washington Conference, museums in Berlin, Dresden, Munich, and many other places as well 
begun to tackle this provenance research. Provenance research is now part of the core mission of our museums since two decades, even if we have to second people from one area to another to do this work. The Bavarian painting, state painting collection was the only museum in 1998 represented by Carla Schulz Hoffmann who took part in the Washington Conference on Holocaust Era Assets. And with the book that you see on your left about Hermann Göring's art collection in 2004, they made this public and made a start. Following on from restitution in the direct post-war period, since 1998, we have concluded 14 further restitution transactions. Many of you will say only 14, but just successfully doing 14, you spend hundreds and thousands that you have to have held to manage to conclude 14. And two further restitution transactions involving six paintings are in the pipeline. And at the moment, half of these restitution cases are based on our own proactive research. The others are based on the request of third parties. And thousands of works only create a handful of claims, but at least we have those. And for that, we have presented everything we have online or are doing so what we haven't so that everyone can look through all the artwork we have to see if there's anything in there that was confiscated. The State Painting Collection has been publishing since 2016 an annual report on historical research on its institution and collections. And there are many areas that this covers. But many questions remain open. But we are in an exchange with Smithsonian and with our colleagues in Bres Dresden and Berlin and working on this subject. Every time we acquire a piece of artwork or consider doing it, we first look at the provenance. The one and a half positions that we have for provenance research, who also have to do other things, do not just work retrospectively, but they also look to the future as well. Before we acquire any artwork, we check its provenance. Every gifting, we check its provenance. In April of this year, I published this. Can museums accept these pieces of art? Yes, we can, because if in doubt, we are the ones who will give them back if there is a claim. If we do not accept arts that are gifted to us, they will disappear in the art world and the opportunity to give them back could be lost. Provenance research continues to work on basic research because we can't just work in terms of the individual objects, but also systematically. And the fourth job of provenance research is, of course, advising within our network. Reliability, continuity, diversity, means of doing it. All of these are things that we need to bear in mind, because even if we have seven researchers in our museum, sometimes in fixed term contracts, sometimes working in a number of areas at once, we are lucky that we have so many. Even if we have, I have spent donation money that you would normally spend on exhibitions or acquiring new pieces of artworks. I've spent it on this. But despite all of the awareness of this, we are the generation that has to do this, and there's a great deal of work. It'll take us years to do it all. Thank you. Thank you. We look now to Jerusalem. I'm very pleased that we're going to hear from Shlomit Steinberg, who's a curator for European art at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, has coordinated a number of exhibitions on Nazi confiscated art and has researched a lot on the whole question of provenance and restitution, was a member of the Gerlit International Task Force. Bukhaba, shalom, Shlomit Steinberg. Thank you. 
Good morning, Ambassador Eisenstadt, Dr. Pratzinger. I would like to thank the organizers of this important conference for inviting me to speak today. I'm proud to be representing the Israel Museum, the institution that has been spearheading the application of the Washington principles in my country by a continuance process of research and restitution of works of art and Judaica for almost 20 years. My talk today, albeit from a somewhat personal point of view, will focus on Israel's involvement since late 2013 with the Gulit International Task Force and the subject of provenance research world countrywide. I'm starting with a quote. A billion dollar worth of painting looted by the Nazis from Jews was discovered in a German basement. Proclaimed an Israeli journalist on the 3rd of November 2013, Ofer Aderet's article was published in the daily newspaper Haaretz immediately after the world was made aware by the news magazine focus of the discovery of the hidden works of art in Cornelius Gurlitz Schwabing apartment. At 5.13 p.m. that day, the news were broadcasted on Galei Tzahal, the Israeli army radio station. The two anchormen interviewed a Tel Aviv-based auctioneer who screeched, billions! These works of art are worth billions! Before sheepishly admitting that he could not actually see the works of art because the website featuring them kind of crashed earlier that morning. <laughs> the local press mentioned artist's name and made wild guesses at the value of the works found. The main question in Jerusalem for the following weeks was to whom these paintings and drawings belonged and who would be receiving them. Would they go to Yad Vashem or more likely the Israel Museum? Obviously, names such as Matisse, Clay, Chagall, and Lieberman whetted everybody's appetite. We do not want them, stated James Snyder, the museum then director, to whoever raised the question with him. Having the Israel Museum holding a trove of almost 800 pieces of Judaica artifacts, 250 works on paper, and 180 paintings that arrived back in the 50s from the American collecting points via the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization, Snyder saw no good reason to add to the museum collection hundreds of works of art that would require endless provenance research and many years of pending restitutions. Back in 2013, the name Hildebrand Gulit was not familiar to me, nor to scholars of art around Israel. Thus, when one of my colleagues was asked by the editor of the newspaper India Express to contribute an article about Nazi art hoard in an apartment in Munich, she passed the request on to me, recalling the exhibition I curated back in 2008, featuring 56 looted paintings from the m and collection kept at the National Museum of France. The article for India actually compelled me to read all I could find at that given moment about Hildenbrand Gulit, his family, his life, his career before, during, and after the war, and finally his death in 56. The Indian editor titled my article, One Man's Garbage, and published it on November 18, 2013. I concluded it with the lines which I quote now. The need for thorough research into the provenance of each and every work of art is essential in order to have them return to their rightful owners, how, whoever they may be. In order to do so, art historians and curators must carry on with their task in a quiet, serene atmosphere. Away from the flashlight of television cameras, and the curious eyes of reporters looking for the latest scoop. Fair and honest results cannot be obtained under time pressure or constant interference, 
let the professional do their jobs and with time the truth and with it justice will certainly come out. Little did I know. Each and every one of the members of the Gulit International Task Force has his or hers personal recruitment story. Mine involves Bobby Brown. The dynamic Brown was the executive director of Project Heart, Holocaust Era Asset Restitution Task Force, a nonprofit initiative of the Jewish Agency, founded by and in cooperation with the government of Israel. The project, launched in late February 12, seeks to trace the heirs of Jewish Holocaust victims worldwide whose families owned real estate, movable, immovable, or other tangible personal property that was confiscated, looted, or forcibly sold in countries governed or occupied by the Nazi forces or Axis powers during the Holocaust era. In early 14, the German government informed the public that they were putting up a task force to research the works of art found in Munich. And I'm quoting, following the discovery of more than 1,000 artworks in the premises of the Gornelius Gullit in Munich, Bavaria, a task force was established in November 13 to ascertain which of those works have been expropriated from their owners by the National Socialist regime between 1933 and 1945. The task force mission was born of Germany's awareness of its responsibility to examine its recent past and account for Nazi crimes. By doing so, Germany upholds the Washington Principles of 1998 and the Joint Declaration of 1999 signed by the German government, the 16 German states, and Central Municipal Association. The research objective was to determine which of the Gulit artworks was potentially looted from their former owners by the Nazi regime, and if so, from whom were they taken? Upon hearing this news, Mr. Brown immediately placed a call to Dr. Ingeborg Bergen Merkel, head of the task force, insisting that the State of Israel be presented by an art expert who would take part in the research. Dr. Bergen Merkel agreed and Bobby informed her there actually will be two representatives, because it's always better than one. Both would be art curators. Mrs. Yudi Chandar will represent the Holocaust Research Center and Museum of Yad Vashem, while the other, me, will come from the fine arts wing of the Israel Museum. Rich experience, access to important archives, and with the delicate know-how of dealing with Holocaust survivors was probably how Bobby described Mrs. Shandar's qualification to Dr. Bergren Merkel. I do not know what you told her about me, but she was convinced. You are the new generation of the legendary monument women, he enthused Mrs. Shandar and me during our first almost clandestine meeting in a nondescript hotel lobby in Jerusalem. Secrecy and discretion were the key words. Journalists and reporters were to be avoided at all costs. And the task at hand was on behalf of the Jews worldwide. And so, on January 2014, we were officially recruited to the task force. Why was it so important to the State of Israel to become involved in the Golet case? After all, one might point out that for years, looted masterpieces have been located in museums all over Europe and the United States. And there have been cases that legitation, legitation took years to solve prior to restitution. And not even once did the State of Israel express interest in the process or the ownership nor did it send an art or law expert to intervene on behalf of the Jewish families involved in this long and expensive litigation. I would like to propose various reasons for the sudden change of heart. To begin with, the, change discovering, the chance discovery of the Schwabing Trove was an unpleasant reminder that the issues of confiscated and looted art are still present as one of the unresolved crimes of the Nazi regime. 
Furthermore, it hinted that there might be more than just one trove, as we soon discovered with the finding of the Salzburg house of the Gulit family, and then the discovery of uh, some more works of art in the house of Benita Gulit. No matter how many exhibition, conferences, and singular cases of restitution have taken place since 1998, a discovery of such proportion meant that more works need to be done in the, work, in the field of research and restitution. Far more alarming was the understanding that somewhere out there, there are likely to be other hidden troves of looted art from the Holocaust era. And who knows when, if ever, they will be discovered. It seems vital, that point in early 14, that the new task force should not follow in the footsteps of the Limbach Commission. The Limbach Commission was set up in 2003 by the German government to mediate Nazi looted art um, restitution disputes. By 14, it was under critical. It, it was under criticism due to its seemingly inactive and lack of transparency. Moreover, emissaries from the Israeli ministries went back and forth to Berlin in order to find out why cases were taking so long to reach a solution. More complicated was the notion that the works of art found at the Munich apartment and later at the Salzburg residence had more than just a murky provenance. Even though Hildebrand Gullit was only a quarter Jew, he did hide behind this partial Jewish origin while under American investigation, and this caused further disdain in Israel. One of the foremost prominent agents working with and for the Third Reich, Golit amassed his art collection between 1937 and 1945. Part of the work must have come from various Jewish collections, which were sold at bargain prices or were otherwise obtained under duress. If indeed this was the case, then the paintings and drawings in the trove are more than just another run of the mill Nazi theft. The state of Israel, home of the Jews and protector of the rights, had to be in the picture. A somewhat awkward bonus stemming from the public interest in the Gulli Task Force activity was the sudden academic interest in the methodology of provenance research, which up to that point was a marginal topic in art and curatorial studies in the academies and museums of Israel. All of the sudden, everyone was talking about provenance or of the lack of it, not only in relationship to looted art, but in general, to be more precise, at the Israel Museum in particular. On the 24th of June, 14, the Israeli governmental company for location and returning Jewish property opened its first international conference with a distinguished statement and diplomat here today, Mr. Stuart Eisenstadt, as keynote speaker. His lecture, titled From Washington Principles to Jerusalem, was critical of how little has been done up to that moment in the field of research and restitution in Israel. The company's stated purpose was to do justice with and for Holocaust victims and their heirs. As part of the action to locate looted property in Israel, the company wanted to use the June International Forum to recruit the art museums and cultural institutes to conduct research within their collection and to raise public interest in the subject, which at that point in time was virtually an unknown territory to so many among them local art historians and curators. A panel titled, Should Culture Items with No Heirs Stay in the Museum for the Benefit of the Public or Be Sold to Benefit Holocaust Survivors caused the exasperated uproar and once again brought up the question of the ESO holding at the Israel Museum collection. After the conference, the Hashava Company, as they were called in Hebrew, initiated a three-day seminar for Israel Museum professionals, instructing them on a basic ways and methods of provenance research. Internationally acclaimed provenance scholars, such as Dr. Sophie Lili from Vienna, and Mrs. Agnes Peschigi, the European Director of the Commission for Art Recovery, and others, including me, 
share their experience and know-how, hoping this initiative would by implementing local museum as a starting point for scrutiny of the collections. On June 14, German Minister of Culture, Professor Monica Grutters visited the Israel Museum and met with us of the Israel Museum senior staff. This visit initiated by the Israel Ministry of Culture and Sports was in connection with the agreement for mutual gov provenance research project which was signed between the Israeli and German ministries of culture during the visit and which the Israel Museum was meant to spearhead. Later that year on November, a delegation headed by Dr. Wienantz, Under Secretary of the German Federal Government Commission for Culture and Media, arrived in Israel. The delegation included Ms. Inka Bertz, Dr. Michael Franz, and Dr. Peter Muller. Fruitful meetings and tours at several local museums were conducted through the Ministry of Culture in Limolivnat chambers where Dr. Wienantz called for a consolidation of the cultural relationship for the research. In the meantime, Mrs. Shandar and I participated in the Gulli Task Force periodical meetings in Berlin, in which research conducted by some group of members were discussed, along with questions stemming from the process. One should point out during that time, the task force and Dr. Berger and Merkel came under media criticism from within as well as from beyond Germany. The death of Cornelius Gullit, his disputed will, the constant nagging about why so few paintings have been restituted was echoed back home in Jerusalem where bad mouthing of the Israel Museum became a twisted kind of bon ton instigated by certain interested parties who knew little and could not care less about how actual provenance research was conducted. We at the museum were working diligently on and with good restitution results. The interest, to be honest, in both capitals was for immediate results, preferably with a photo opportunity. Tempers flared, frustration was something we experienced throughout 15 in Berlin and Jerusalem. In early 16, the task force group was dispersed and we parted ways. The diligent research on the works of art continues but this time, away from the center and far from the media. A lesson to us all? Probably. In the last two years, the Gulli Trove received more exposure than before. It was turned into four exhibitions, two in Bern, one in Bonn, and recently here at the Gruppius Bau in Berlin. More exhibitions will hopefully take place in the coming years. By now, nine works of art have found the rightful owners and other works are pending restitution. For me personally, becoming part of the task force was a decisive moment in my professional life, both as an art curator, as an eternal student of history of art. I would like to conclude this talk by quoting my task force mentor, Dr. Andrea Berezel-Brandt, who said, if you clarify the history of a work of art, you liberate it, you open it up to the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now hear something about networking strategies in provenance research. And here I would like to welcome Jane Milosh. We've heard about PrEP already. That was mentioned several times. She herself is the director of the Smithsonian Provenance Research Exchange Program, PrEP for short. And this is headquartered in Washington, D.C. And it is um, American-German Corporation, and that is exactly what she would like to tell you about. We've heard from Mr. Patzinger that the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation is part of it, is part of this network. The Smithsonian is as well. So it's all about systematically connecting provenance researchers in the museums of the respective countries. We will hear more from Jane now. Welcome. Guten Tag. Ich bedanke mich erst ganz herzlich für die Einladung nach Berlin zu kommen 
First of all, I would like to thank all of you uh, for the invitation. At this conference, and especially with the title "A Roadmap for the Future," my talk will actually draw upon this metaphor, roadmap, by stress stressing the need for a superhighway, a Holocaust-era provenance research autobahn, a network through which we can connect expertise and accelerate shared results through ongoing, systematic exchanges between people and international and public institutions. With my esteemed colleagues in the audience, most of them, of the steering committee of PREP, I believe a model of, for, this, for this kind of network to be sustainable is the German-American Provenance Research Exchange Program for Museum Professionals, which is running from 2017 to 2019. PREP is a collaborative partnership between seven museums and research institutions with important holdings relevant to World War II era provenance research in the US and Germany. Co-organized by the Smithsonian Institution, the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, as also co-chaired by Dr. Potzinger and also by Dr. Richard Curran, and ably led by the very impressive Corolla Telica, our partners also include the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Getty Research Institute, the Zentrale Institut für Kunstgeschichte München, the Staatliche Kunstsammlung Dresden, and the Deutsche Zentrum Kulturgutverluste is also a consultative partner. As we've been hearing all along this conference, um, <clears throat> the information about art ownership paths of the 1930s to the present is really dispersed throughout museums, archives, libraries, and research centers, and private homes around the world. Thus, resources have for decades remained siloed at individual institutions due to cultural and historical, academic and legal systems of the organizations and nations involved. PREPS is a collaborative approach attempting to connect the German-American research roads and encouraging side roads and on-ramps so that experts in other countries, as well as the public we serve, can benefit from PREPS accomplishments. Now, two years, into PREP's program, approximately 150 museums, archives, research institutes, universities, libraries, the CARS, plus 300 experts who are the drivers who work at these institutions and specialize in very different aspects of provenance research are now on the PREP Autobahn. PREP's principal vehicle is a series of exchanges over a three-year period which build upon each other and introduce established and emerging researchers to each other's professional practices, methodology, resources, and the museum and research cultures, as well as the re related legal system. Each year, the PREP Steering Committee selects, through a competitive process, a new cohort of 21 German and American museum experts to attend two exchanges that year, one in Germany, one in US. Partic participants include provenance researchers, curators, archivists, collection managers, information technology and legal experts, as well as graduate students. Thus, PREP brings the whole panoply of museum expertise into the planning for the future of provenance research. And I just want to add here that um, this is really critical right now because we're facing a generational change. My generation that grew up without all this technology, who did all of our research in archives, with a young generation that started on the internet. So we really need to be mentoring and doing a knowledge transfer at this point in time. Otherwise, we're going to really lose a very important opportunity. So PREP is really working to generate a long-term, ongoing example of how to advance results in the field of World War II era provenance research. We are also prioritizing multiples and focusing on Asian art, decorative arts, and works on paper. And PREP is widening the scope of this research so that we can begin to gain a fuller picture of things that have been dispersed. Each of the six exchanges is hosted by a partner institution comprised of roundtables, symposia, hands-on tours, meetings with their counterparts in the host city's museums and archives. These are more than workshops or just a training program. It's a cultural and a personal exchange of individuals and the birth of a provenance network. PREP participants discuss their work in depth, in small groups, and not just during the two exchanges, but between the time that the exchanges take place and afterward. So we're really working to connect the valuable resources so as to advance their, their work and implement new methods for international dissemination. And very importantly, 
Each host city, um, each city's exchange includes at least one educational public program. These programs have attracted large audiences and media coverage, showing that in fact many are interested in the personal stories of the Holocaust and seek a better understanding of contemporary issues, cultural heritage, and, 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 mu and museums through the lens of provenance. We couldn't be doing all of this, of course, if we didn't have any money. So PrEP is generously funded by the German government's program for transatlantic encounters, the Bundesregier for Kultur in Medien, the seven PrEP partners, institutions, and many donors. It is helping to construct a more complete, a more complete picture of art misappropriation from the national socialism to contemporary times. First, I'd like to step back a little bit and, and talk about a few events that informed the creation of PrEP. In 2008, the Smithsonian's Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture asked me to expand the institution's commitment to World War II era provenance research. With noted expert researcher Lori Stein as senior advisor, we founded the Smithsonian Provenance Research Initiative to prioritize and facilitate art provenance research, research across the institution. We have 18, I'm sorry, we now have 19 museums at the Smithsonian, just, just by way of context. To move our World War II era research forward at these museums, we augmented our professional staff at these diverse museums by attempting to match them with specialists in World War II era research who have the expertise that these uh, media or region-specific museums lacked. This, re this included proficiency in German language, deep knowledge of the art markets before, during, and after the war, and the relevant history of the Holocaust. We also saw the need for institutional partnerships and ongoing discussions, and the, and the many people and events who helped to catalyze in the development, there are many, excuse me, many people and events that helped to catalyze the development of PrEP. But I just want to mention a few. First, Germany's Arbeitskreis für Provenienzforschung, so ably described by Leo uh, earlier today. When I attended my first meeting in 2009, I was surprised to learn how many German researchers of the National Socialist Era were engaged with some of the same issues that re U.S. researchers were working on. But these projects and findings were little known in the U.S., and we talked about how we needed to stop reinventing the wheel. In 2011, SPREE, that's the program I used to direct, um, co-organized with the National Archives, the Association of Art Museum Directors, and the Association of Art Museums, a symposium to launch the International Research Portal for Records Related to Nazi-Era Cultural Property, which we've been hearing about. This portal, this portal and symposium attracted 150 people from 60 museums and 10 European continents. And we saw an interest for more opportunities that facilitated face-to-face -face discussions, not just one-off academic conferences, but gatherings. Gatherings that brought museum professionals together for systematic meetings and topics that would, over time, build on each other and create an international network. Just for an update, the IP2 portal is now live on ARI. So at that time, 2011, you could find things, but thank you to Michael Kortz and the work of the Digital Curation Center at the University of Maryland, you can go on ARIES portal and now cross-search things. Also in 2011, inspired by the Arbeitskreisier Provenienzforschung, the Smithsonian organized an informal series called Provenance Research Roundtables, which we hosted at different cities. In 2014, we published a journal on Holocaust-era provenance research in, in U.S. museums so that a wider public could read about the advances and the projects underway in the U.S. Underway is important because often, you know, we, we hear results and we need to be talking while we're doing this research. And also, as you've just heard from my other colleague, um, um, Schlomit, I also served on the Gerlitz Task Force as the U.S. representative for two, for two years, and I don't need to go on and go on about that, but many of the things that we discussed and learned from there also led to the, to the development of PrEP. So these events also showed us that it wasn't just our interest, but we also had to have institutional buy-in, and their support was critical because only institutions have the power and the longevity to make and sustain change that is public-facing, and they are accountable for professional standards, collection policies, and the public we serve. It is impossible to move our research forward to connect these silos without trust and collaboration. 
So together with colleagues in Germany and the US, and I want to just name a few of them here, Christian Vormeister for the Zentral Institut für Kunstgeschichte, Krola Telika and Petra Winter at SPK, Crystal Force and Becky Murray at the Met, Thomas Gakins, Christian Weimer at the Getty Research Institute, Uwe Schneider, Uwe Hartmann, and Gilbert Luffer at the DZK and in Dresden, as well as Isabel pfeiffer punskin and Stephanie Tosh at Kulturstift und Länder. Really a great group that I got to know over the two years while I was here on the Gerlich Task Force. We talked about where, where we would find the, funny, find the funding to establish an international network, and very importantly, how to connect these silos long term. Thus, in 2016, the Smithsonian and SPK applied for and received a three-year grant for, for PrEP, largely financed by the German Program for Transatlantic Encounters of the European Recovery Program, ERP. This is funded through the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, and funded also by the German Commission of Culture and Media. Here I must also thank Minister, Minister Monica Gruters for her support, as well as Bertrand von Moltke at the Foreign Ministry, and Reiner Rohr, former director of, director of the Fulbright Program in Germany. I first met Bertram when he was at, was at the German Embassy in Washington, and it was actually a conversation with him that first made us aware of this funding by ERP, which was largely only for university exchanges, and he suggested we might try it for this museum professional exchange. Herora had known since 1987 when I had a Fulbright to Germany, and his advice proved invaluable. Additional support for PrEP comes from the seven PrEP partner institutions, the Smithsonian's Women's Committee, and many individual, individual donors, including Fernand Müller Stiftung and Norman and Suzanne Kohn. PrEP has several goals. I'm just going to mention a few. The first is to provide a locus of extended scholarly person-to-person -person exchange, calling upon the expertise of various departments within museums to contribute to the international debate around provenance, restitution, and related policy issues. Secondly, PREP aims to engender trust by enabling a more nuanced comprehension of the differences and similarities between German and American approaches to research and their responses to claims. To bring content, to bring the, to bring content experts and information technology Technologies, technologists together to also maximize the potential of new technologies. Here you see um, Barbara from Dresden, uh, because how do we collect all of these labels? So this is something we've been talking about. And <clears throat> how to specifically meet the needs of the 21st century provenance research and to share the research results more broadly. And fourthly, because media stories often cover only the highly contentious litigations, blocking the more complete picture of steady institutional efforts, both in Germany and the US, to educate the public in the complexities and challenges of World War II era provenance research, and increase transparency of provenance research uh, efforts in museums, actually while the work is going on and not just when it's complete. So what have we achieved so far through the program? The Autobahn is flourishing. Information between Germany and the US has increased and more flu has become more fluid and sustained through diverse means. We have held four exchanges. In 2017, our first PrEP exchange was held in New York, hosted by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That same year, the second exchange was hosted in Berlin by SPK. In 2018, the exchange was hosted in LA by the Getty. <clears throat> and the fourth exchange uh, was hosted by the Zentrale Institut für Kunstgeschichte this past month. Because PrEP partners dialogue with other cultural and educational institutions in these host cities, these different museums and archives and institutes and university and libraries are also part of PrEP's research Audubon, creating a strong multiplier effect fueled by the expanding circle of institutions and individuals drawn into the project. We've inspired new collaborative and interdisciplinary research to help resolve long-standing questions regarding individual objects, including research on World War II era antiquities and colonial collections. We have increased communication and trust between museum and those whose families were dispossessed, despoiled of their art and their valuable objects. 
We have informed provenance-focused exhibitions in the U.S. and Germany that engage their publics with the compelling stories that provenance reveals. So what's next? In March 2019, we will hold the fifth exchange in Dresden, hosted by SKD. And the sixth exchange will be held in Washington, D.C. by the Smithsonian. For the 2019 exchanges, we received more than 50 applications from 48 institutions. In fact, frustratingly, many more outstanding applicants than we could accommodate. The final exchange in Washington, D.C. will highlight the results of all three years. It will also stage an international colloquium on the World War II-era provenance research, and it will feature public presentations by the PrEP programs, PrEP program participants, and the program outcomes. PrEP will publish an online resource for World War II-era provenance research in Germany and the U.S. to serve, to serve not only the museum community and the academy, but the academy, but also the public. Also, following the DC PrEP exchange in collaboration with the German Historical Institute, we will host a symposium on provenance research of post-colonial collections to ensure that substantive exchange with Germany and Amer German and American colleagues informs both historical and wider contemporary debates surrounding the preservation of cultural heritage. In conclusion, for, the Nazi, for Nazi era provenance research in museums to continue and expand, more support is needed. I think that's an understatement, both institutionally and financially. Provenance is, by its very nature, a work in progress, and it is seldom complete. We urgently need new technology that links our collection data and our expertise with other areas of study and increases accessibility. We, as museums and scholars, cannot right all the wrongs of the past. We may not, despite our best efforts, succeed in restoring all the stolen art during the National Socialist regime, but we can tell the stories of those who lost their lives and or were dispossessed of their belongings and experiences which helped to define their lives. <laughs> that's really the goal. Museums are stewards, and that's actually what museums do. I just want to say, sometimes I get frustrated. I, until I entered into provenance research, people said, well, museums hold all these looted things, and I thought, I don't know anyone who came to work for a museum except to provide greater access to art, so that's why we're there for, for everyone. Um, so museums are stewards, not, not only of art and material culture, but also the stories we tell through those objects we are obligated to tell them in the most truthful and complete way we can. Whoops. We, now have a, we, ha we now have a network of cars, drivers, and a highway, and hopefully PrEP will continue to improve the roadmap to our destination. PrEP's Provenance Research Autobahn is an achievement of which, of which all involved can be proud of. The German government, PrEP partners, those individuals and institutions who have contributed to and continue to participate in it. PrEP is an accomplishment of which I am most proud of during my time at the Smithsonian. And although the Smithsonian leadership of PrEP will end in 2019, I hope and trust that, the, <clears throat> that, an, that its legacy will continue and will be secured by further institutional uh, organizations and countries. So thank you to my Smithsonian team, my many colleagues and supporters. Without your encouragement and hard work, we would not have come this far. And I look forward to the coming year to the coming year. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thanks. Thank you, Jane Milos. So. Right, and I would now like to hand over to Stephanie Tusch, the art historian who I'd like to introduce very briefly. She is in charge of the Ars Pro Toto quarterly art history magazines, which you'll all know. Stephanie Atash has published a great deal about collecting. Private collecting is one of the lectures on provenance research at Berlin's Free University. She has also spent several years working in the Schwabinger Kunstfund Tastort. She's also part of the Lost Arts Foundation in Germany and <coughs> on the Advisory Council of the Art Market Study Center of Berlin Technical University. Well, enjoy the panel discussion. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Kupferbach, for these kind words of introduction. Ambassador Eisenstadt, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, 
Um, as one of the many speakers and moderators, let me also welcome you and thank you for allowing me to be here. Above all, I would like to ask our panelists to join me on the stage straight away so I can then introduce them once they're all sitting here. So they're coming from all over the place, which is lovely. Wonderful. Now everybody's here. Given our slight time problem, I have been requested, or rather we have all agreed, that um, following the statements which our panelists will give, we will immediately extend the debate to involve the audience as well. I'll um, take the liberty of giving you some of the um, buzzwords that we decided we w would like to see addressed, which otherwise we would have debated on the panel, that also by way of a possible suggestion to the audience. Apart from that, we have now reached a point at this meeting where one might almost start to think back to the meeting. I'd still like to say a few introductory words. Magnus Richten, Leo Weidinger, and uh, Agnes Pergetsi have given us some very important hints. Marcus, Magnus Brechten's contribution really highlighted the tension that exists between politics and academia in our area and in the large uh, field of provenance research and restitutions. Um, Mr. Weidinger gave us very inspiring words uh, honoring provenance research and researchers, highlighting also their rather precarious uh, conditions of work, and Agnes, who said very dryly yesterday, well, nobody had expected things to take as long as it has done. And that time issue is also interesting for us. A fortnight ago, when the Provenance Research Working Group met in Berlin, one more sentence was uh, said, which was crucial. It was something which was said by Estatisa Francini, who is a Swiss provenance researcher. What she said was that the exchange with colleagues replaced training options, and further education for provenance researchers was simply moved to the working group. And that's a very precise summary of the situation. Leo Weidinger and Professor Patzinger in their presentations also mentioned that the situation in the year 2000, when there was just four colleagues who set up this working group, was rather different from the development we've seen until now. And we have um, some initial initiatives for education, skilling, and further education in this field. One of the insights gleaned yesterday and today is the fact that behind the Washington principles and their implication, implementation, we see a growing research infrastructure. And that is what we need to have. I mean, everybody has said what we want to see. But equally, we saw that fair and just uh, solutions cannot happen without provenance research. Yes, certainly, but no provenance research without provenance researchers. And by setting up our working group for provenance research, which is part of the State Museums of Berlin at the Institute for Museum Research, where it was established in 2008, we took the first step to, to uh, have systematic provenance research as a standardized part of public facilities in Germany. And all the measures which have been taken since have only made clear how much there is in the way of need for properly trained researchers in the field of provenance research. So we've seen the more is done, the more need there is for people who are expert in it. Learning by doing, well, we see an increasing network, and that's what they've always been been done, uh, been doing. But that is definitely not enough for what the growing um, demand is requiring. We see lots of projects which lack the provenance researchers now. Apart from the empirical uh, method of uh, provenance research training, we also see increasing demands for theoretical education for involving um, provenance research into uh, the study of art history. 
um, bearing in mind that this is a discipline which uh, looks primarily at uh, gathering facts, but this was uh, slightly erroneous because it goes deeper. Learning by doing, however, is not a method we should underestimate. In the first years, uh, it was virtually all women members of the working group. Um, and um, what they've achieved, uh, including the, uh, the first people they've been training, uh, is actually an extraordinary uh, networking and training ability from which researchers all over are still benefiting. I, I must say um, that this is not something which the majority of um, academic research has been aware of. Christoph Susha, who's uh, at the moment next to me, wrote an article two years ago where he talked about the rapid acceleration in the field of provenance research, which is becoming more academic and better integrated into the sort of academic research landscapes. A factor not to be underestimated in this achievement is the great interest of students in having more information about um, art history, collection, art dealing, uh, the rights to protect cultural heritage, and so on. We now have six uh, renowned experts from art history and the field of law, um, and their very presence is the result of um, a long drawn out but rapidly increasing development. Training and further education options have increased in recent years. Again, our panelists bear witness to that. But it's not just in Berlin, Bonn, and Hamburg, where we now have study courses for provenance research. This now extends further Würzburg, Oldenburg, Passau, Bern in Switzerland. You've heard about PrEP. Maybe you should also know that there are other players, like the Central Institute for Art History, which has played a pioneering role, as many have pointed out. But the various uh, associations of museums, for example, in Berlin and Brandenburg, they also play quite a role in further education in this field. To give you some uh, idea of what we want to talk about, the green buttons um, are an indicator. Uh, the green buttons also stand for the sustainability of this uh, education and university related provenance research. What are these study courses about? What's their purpose? Who is trained and for what? Um, cooperation, institutional cooperation is certainly one factor, but uh, it's also always uh, something which touches on the field of tension between politics and academia. And with this, I would like to come to our panelists, starting with uh, Professor Dr. Christoph Zuschlag, who's sitting on my immediate left from April 2018. He um, has held the Alfred Krupp von Bohlen and Halbach Chair for Art History, History Contemporary and uh, Modern Art at the Art History Institute of Rhineland Rhein University Bonn the Friedrich Wilhelm University with name. Next to him is Professor Weller, who uh, is part of the Law School of Bonn University, where he holds another Alfred Bolen, Krupp von Bolen and Halbach Foundation Chair for Civil Law, Art, and the Right to Protect Cultural Heritage. As a third representative also from Bonn University, I would like to uh, welcome Professor Ulrike Sass, Junior Professor for Cultural Historical Provenance Research at the Art History Institute. Institute. The three together make up the Providence Research Cultural <laughs> Goods um, Legal Issues, which uh, we have heard about uh, in this uh, setup. Um, from Hamburg University, I'm very happy to introduce to you Gisa Nolte. She holds the Liebel Foundation Professorship for Provenance Research in History and uh, Contemporary Art at the Art History Seminar of Hamburg University. And uh, Ludwig Maximilian University Munich is represented by Professor Dr. Antoinette Marie Dominice, where she has been holding a junior professorship uh, from the 1st of April, also on the protection of cultural heritage and provenance research at the Art History Institute. She presented herself uh, last October. And last but not least, we have with us Dr. Maike Hoffmann from Berlin's Free University. She's um, a, a scientific staff member at the Science Institute dealing with degenerate art. 
And from 2011, as we've heard, she is offering one module teaching provenance research. Since 2017, she is the project coordinator of the Mossa Art Research Initiative. And now I would like to ask you to give us the first statement. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so, uh, not going by alphabet, my name starts with a Z, so i would start. We have prepared a very brief statement in order to start a discussion, not just with each other, but also with you. At the beginning, I will reiterate some of the things you've said, but uh, repetition is a stylistic device after all. At the summer term 2018, the University of Bonn started with two chairs uh, provided by the Alfred Krupp von Bohlen and Halbach Foundation. One is in the law school, focusing on the law governing the protection of art and cultural heritage, and another one which uh, focuses on the philosophical aspects of provenance research and collection history. In addition, the university has financed a junior professorship for art historical provenance research. These three are comprised in one big research center, which is, um, goes across disciplines. After five years, the university will continue this um, in the longer run, in irrespective of the foundation, and that gives us planning certainty. Among the projects we are planning, we want to conceptualize a master study course on provenance research and collection history. In the winter term 2019-2020, this course will start. Uh, it has a USP because uh, there are two modules which are completely legal. Uh, i.e. law matters will be taught. It's very widely based uh, provenance research course here, which looks not just at the historical injustice context committed, which the current re provenance research is very much uh, focusing on, as far as the public is aware also, that concerns Nazi stolen art, but also GDR um, stolen art and the colonial context. In this context, we are also looking at which are the other subjects which will be necessary or useful to add, like history, politics, economics, post-colonial studies, or others. Thank you. I'd also like to thank very much for the kind word of introduction, Ms. Tush. Christoph, you also, thanks for giving us the explanatory context for these three professorships in Bonn in your very concise way. Now, some people may ask in this tandem or trial, however much you uh, want to look at it, why on earth include law? Uh, shouldn't I be the sort of uh, legal sidekick on, a, on an art history panel? And maybe that's also the bend of the whole conference. So why should law play such a role in the context of the issue at hand? Now, I think there are two reasons for that. One may be a minor, but the other one, I think, is a fundamental issue. The minor issue concerns the fact that uh, law obviously has to contribute to making provenance research possible and facilitate it wherever by clarifying legal issues that might provide a level of uncertainty for the daily work of provenance researchers. And currently this particularly concerns data protection issues. We're all uh, burdened by the many uncertainties which uh, the uh, European data protection uh, rules have now uh, given us, and I think my thesis, that would be the first uh, sort of legal thesis, is that in particular this uh, new data protection uh, regulation would allow us in provenance research to do far more than most people would consider possible, and tomorrow morning we'll have a special workshop on that where this particular thesis will be um, explained in greater detail. There are other points as well. There are sort of copyright issues like, can I put um, a picture about uh, some uh, object which was or was not restituted online for the purpose of information? These are all many little issues which sort of the, the engine room uh, is working on the engine room of uh, provenance research, and then there hasn't yet been a proper home for these issues at universities. And our law um, professorship, uh, the law part of the course, is exactly to answer these questions. And now the other point, which is very important also for me because I'm dealing with standards and norms and, and I'm a legal expert, it's, it's not really a, a, a sidekick in the Washington principles um, when we're looking at uh, just and fair solutions. Actually, 
it is the central issue to have a normative objective which we want to achieve. And that's why uh, anybody dealing with normative matters like law experts have a lot to contribute here. We're dealing with the production, the enabling, the organization of justice. And we have looked into the methodology for this. And we have gained a lot of diverse experience in this field, all of which should be used uh, for the process of uh, establishing fair and just solutions. And both yesterday and today, we've always had um, sort of moments when normative issues were addressed, like uh, shall we have a balancing of interests, or uh, what about um, art which was sold while escaping? There are all sorts of issues which um, create divergence in the decision-making practice. So from uh, our angle, that would be um, quite normal. The question how is, how can we react to that? One possibility is that uh, we see, oh, well, um, just note what is happening, put it um, um, on a place. Um, I would call that statement of restitution rules that we want to work out in order to then discuss more precisely what are the rules we consider to be appropriate and for which reasons, and so that questions which deal with uh, such um, rules can also be decided on following the same principle, i.e. this standard principle. That normative approach would indeed help to improve the Washington principles, and that is definitely one of the um, contributions that we can make in our field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, that uh, allows me to immediately ask the next question, why art history? Because provenance research these days is extremely interdisciplinary in character. Apart from working with the um, art and cultural objects, we're looking at the art market, we're looking at who owns what, the question of the reception of the works of art, uh, under certain conditions where we're looking at uh, economic, political, social questions, knowledge about current and uh, past legal systems. That is just as important as very thorough research, analysis of files and documents, a proper analysis and interpretation of the documents. And this is just a few. These are just a few examples. For teaching, for me, this means that it's absolutely imperative to work together with colleagues from other disciplines. And that is something which makes us ask, is provenance research properly housed within art history? I think art history can indeed be, and perhaps should, um, act as an integral part of uh, provenance research, last but not least because the history of, of art has proved that interdisciplinary work is one of our core competences. And uh, in provenance research, um, it's not an integral part of the art historical methodology, but because one feeds the other. The importance of the external materiality is focused on, and the inherent values and meanings of certain objects is what we're analyzing, put in a proper context, and look at the social systems in which an object was during different transfers of ownership, and we try to interpret those correctly. Before I start, I would like to say something about the setup of my professorship. As we said, it's a junior professorship, but at the same time, it is um, endowed by a foundation, a private um, Hamburg um, a sponsor uh, has sponsored this chair for six years, Hamburg Liebig in Hamburg. So I'm a junior professor, but before that I was active in provenance research for 10 years. My experience here is that as part of the usual stock taking and uh, inventory research, systematical research into the context of the items is normally not done. And even the working group provenance research for about 20 years kept pointing out how urgently necessary this type of basic research is. As we've heard frequently, uh, knowledge about 
the art market, the networks, the dealers, the framework conditions in which people operated. Knowledge from that area are crucial because they allow us to appraise transactions and will be helpful when deciding on restitution. And as a professor for provenance research, I see my job in initiating just such projects. It's also my opinion, but um, we should always cooperate with these many institutions which have been engaging in provenance research for years already. That is imperative because object-related research has often provided valuable research results and that is um, something which already exists in a context. We just have to uh, put it in, in, in a systematic methodological way and relate it to the correct context. That is why I'm very much focusing on contextual research, which I uh, would like to uh, legitimize, what Benedict Savoy gestern um, called a, a sort of marriage between universities and um, museums. Apart from all the benefits that such a linkage can provide, there is also a drawback, namely that uh, a partnership on an equal footing in the research um, community has not been established to a very large extent. And that's why we have so many difficulties, which uh, is manifest when you're looking at the very few uh, research promotional programs in this field. And I hope that the very few professors we have will indeed work on that issue. Um, You've heard the title of this professorship, and that means that the um, Institute for Art History at the Ludwig Maximilian University is sending out a strong signal. It's not just about provenance research. It is also about the material and immaterial value of cultural items, their pathways, their messages, their organizations, which are in collections. If you ask about the provenance, the origin of cultural goods, then we'll also ask about the terminology of state, religion, colonialization, immigration, emigration, trade. As a result, there are very complex um, network relations. And in Munich, therefore, we value uh, the discursive and non-discursive practical approach to how we deal with the cultural heritage and with cultural items in general. And we do that without limiting ourselves to one or one time or space. This type of um, approach is to allow students to obtain cultural knowledge and also to try and exercise a critical way of dealing with these um, items. And that's why we have special seminars and exercises on specific cases. Apart from the necessary uh, self-critical uh, approach, this um, new method is also a reaction to what we've heard yesterday and today is, is an only partly established sustainability of provenance research. So we'll have to um, and, and possibly can't find other ways of the students to, to be involved and to involve other fields. Those cultural items um, where the origin is particularly important, we need to uh, trade where, where an object came from, and these many relational aspects may go far beyond the uh, realm of Europe, and that is something else we need to study. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much indeed, um, Stephanie Touch, for the kind word of introduction. And as we've just heard from Stephanie, I've been involved uh, since the pre girlit days, that's 2011, when I've been offering a uh, course on provenance research at the Munich, uh, at Berlin's Free University. We've developed a module uh, where lots and lots of different colleagues were involved in uh, shaping it, and many of them are still involved uh, on, in the working group and in the module, and they're with us often, they're with us today. Um, research and teach, teach and research is very much the motto which involves the students in what we're doing at Berlin's Free University. There are students, um, and they're learning um, within institutions uh, like museums and archives where they analyze documents and 
um, look into these um, works of art. And they're looking at uh, sort of the Mosse Art Research Initiative, the Berlin Art Dealings in the Weimar Republic of the Third Reich. And these are some big projects we're dealing with at the moment. And what I love involving my students, and that also helps to motivate them to um, learn while researching in this field of provenance research. To uh, provide a, a connection between teaching and, and researching, we have um, properly customized databases, customized for provenance research, but they can do far more than simply document the results of provenance research work. So these databases are seen more as an open communication, communication platform or um, you might consider them a flexible research tool, if you like. I think what Leonard Weidinger said earlier is uh, right. It's not the main difficulty to have these databases. There are quite a lot of them, and, and the biggest challenge is not to combine them at, at one point. I mean, even today, we have the technical abilities to make these programs flexible and, and very open, but um, all these initiatives need to get off the ground. I mean, we have databases which uh, can be compatible, I mean, are compatible with all sorts of different systems, and, and they were set up in such a way that the metadata we make available can indeed be connected with the metadata of other databases. When this concept was developed in our Berlin Working Group with other guest lecturers back in 2011, it was already clear that we needed properly trained experts young um, provenance researchers. Despite this, we decided not to start with a master study course because provenance research as such um, is not one discipline. And it's still considered to be a sort of an assistant discipline, a, a minor, not a major subject. But equally, the dis interdisciplinary character of this research approach is not something we can so easily um, integrate into existing German university structures. However, by now, the um, opportunities of studying have been put on a much wider footing so that we at the university level can go to the academic meta level without neglecting the practical work either. So one of the questions I would like to ask is, how can we jointly work on a methodolo methodology of provenance research and what are the standards that we need in order to provide quality assurance for what we teach? Well, thank you very much, all six of you, for this slam session um, in university provenance research. I think for all of you in the audience that will have widened uh, your uh, knowledge about how um, what the scope is for this research and what they still want to do. And now I'll hand over to you for questions. Wesley Fisher, Claims Conference and World Jewish Restitution Organization. Um, a comment and a question to you. Uh, the Holocaust Studies institutions of the world were formed by the Jewish group. Yad Vashem, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is an intergovernmental organization, and various others in the universities have tended not to talk about property. They certainly haven't talked about this field particularly at all, and indeed, as we sit here talking about this, there's a completely separate international discussion going on in Ferrara, Italy, of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which, of which Germany is a member and many other countries as well. Um, part of this has been interpreted as the result of a fear by the Jewish organizations of anti-Semitic stereotypes, that a focus on property would mean that people were thinking in terms of Jewish interest in money and so forth in the, in the stereotypical uh, anti-Semitic matters. Um, I'm just curious what your relations are with historians of the Holocaust. It has been said that as the older generation is going in uh, Germany, there is not a replenishment or not enough replenishment of Holocaust historians in Germany. I was rather surprised with uh, Dr. Bretchen's uh, matter that he didn't mention Gersta Lee or any of these other people. And I was also interested that uh, in his discussion, too, there was relatively little idea of Germany 
as having looked at the history of the Fed. So I'm just curious what your experience has been. Yeah, my Ladies and gentlemen, you can see that we're a bit perplexed up here on the panel, S a certain bewilderment. I'll try to respond. In Germany, we have excellent institutions like the Fritz Bauer Institute, the Institute for Contemporary History, and the deputy head was here yesterday, Mr. Brechtken, Brechtken rather you refer to him. The Holocaust studies does not focus is not a focus of our work in provenance research, but of course in the context of dealing with the Nazi injustice, we do look at it, but it's sort of in the bigger context, if you see what I mean. Perhaps I could just add something to that and say that my professorship is entitled Provenance Research in, Hi in History and in the Contemporary World, which comprises the Nazi regime as well as having the mandate to go beyond this and to go before it time-wise and after it. So it is a very broad scope that my professorship covers and which focuses in the art history teaching in art history seminars and lectures to have sort of initial approaches of provenance research, i.e. questions and methods that come up within provenance research and to just sort of establish them at all. I think I have to say it as, as carefully as that. Yeah. Um, Christian Formas, Central Institute for Art History. You called for more provision, Ms. Vella, and I'd like to respond to that because what we have here is language. In the declaration yesterday, that was the common declaration. It talks about professorships for provenance research at a number of institutes, chairs of provenance research at various institutes, it says, various universities. But what the panel shows us is that we haven't, it seems, got a single professorship or chair for provenance research because Christoph Zuschlag has a professorship for art of modernity and contemporary art, 19th to 20th century. And then it takes a while, and then it says, bearing in mind the history of collection and provenance research. So the, we've heard a number of different denominations, and the question that Wesley Fisher is asking aims at ascertaining how many Washington principles are in the label provenance research as set out in the various different versions that we've got going here. So my question would be, to what extent is this different significance between chairs for provenance research that we do not have? University of Bonn decided against setting up a chair just for provenance research. It said that for various reasons, it would have a professor professorship for modernity with particular care for the issue, blah, 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 but that's different. And what we've heard is that there's a wide range of approaches here, which is a good thing. But there is a contradiction here to the common declaration that sets out a number of professorships, i.e. a W3 salary professorships, senior professorships, and, and what we're seeing here with the junior professorships. Thank you very much. Christian, that's absolutely right. My professorship covers modern and contemporary art as well, focusing on history of collections of arts and, and province research. And it is the only actual professorship. The others are junior professorships, though I hope we will do such good work in the years to come soon that we will actually manage to get permanent professorships here. That would be my hope. Let me say that I don't think this is a contradiction the fact that we have these different denominations of these chairs. I think my issue is just what Mr. Patzinger was describing here, namely to make it clear that provenance research from where I'm standing has the potential to look at a provenance turn. I think we are experiencing a provenance turn in the cultural histories. I think that the biography of these artifacts makes will make it possible to find or help us find access to artifacts in a whole different way. So even if I'm interested in informal art, which I am, I'm very interested in provenance. 
So it's not just about saying, right, this is provenance research in my one lecture, and in the other one on modernity, I don't do it. No, I make it clear that this is relevant for all historical contexts, and that there's a huge potential here to gain knowledge. And Uwe Hartmann made this clear yesterday, saying that provenance research makes it possible for us to access artworks in a whole different way that we would never have without it. And I believe that this needs to be far more part of what we exhibit in museums and what we do in museums. And it's not just a, the job of a specialized group of students or lecturers at universities. And, and my aspiration to myself and my team would be that all students of this generation and future generations understand the significance of this issue. Can I just add one sentence to that? Because you did direct me, your question to me, but then we went over to the province research. My chair has no reference to provenance research, and perhaps that's what you're criticizing. But I don't think criticism is necessarily justified here. My chair is entitled, the domination is for civil rights and the right of cultural assets and culture, which covers a whole industry in society, a whole sector, including the issue that we're debating here, namely 20 years Washington principles. So I'm coming from uh, the University of Bonn with a long tradition, and it works on civil law, litigation, arbitration, mediation are major issues that it looks at, and I think it's extremely good for the scientific support and academic support of the issues that we're talking about here, if we're talking about the rights of fair and just organization, uh, just and fair solutions to organize this in a broader horizon legally in standardized terms than just to leave these issues up to others. Maybe I could add something here and say that provenance research isn't just looking at the past, but in a certain way, it's also looking at the future because th there are a number of conflict zones in the world at the moment whose cultural assets are finding their way into private collections in some cases. And in 15 or 20 years, they will perhaps be offered as estates when the owners have died to museums. So in 15 or 20 years, those of us who are still working we need to prepare for cases like this. And we haven't yet set a framework for this. And that's why I think we can hope that there'll be another declaration in which the principles will be s tweaked slightly, but that we will have students who have studied this and will be able to support the institutions as they deal with these estates. Mr. Martz, Mars. I wanted to, I'll wait for you. No? Okay, then I'll ask my question or say what I want to say. So I think what we're not promising is how we are going to link provenance with exhibitions. They're already doing that. Museums are doing that. There are exhibitions about provenance. But what we do hope to see is that in the imaginary reunification in 10 years' time, if we all do meet again, we will then maybe know who you are and what you are, but we will also be able to trace where the students you taught have gone. And against the background of the volatility of the issues we're dealing with here, it's going to be extremely important for all of you to have a kind of observation reconnaissance flight over the generation that is now being trained. Because like you said, apart from the issue of the Holocaust, there are many other issues that are going to be coming up too. So we need to promise that those issues that come up afterwards, those who are trained don't just do learning by doing the way that we have, but that they are taught methods and develop methods that they can apply to other issues as well. That's what we must hope for. And that's why I'm glad that there's so many here, even as we've already heard, they there aren't designated provenance research chairs. I wonder if I could just add something to this discussion here or to this comment of Mr. Maas's. I think it fits. I am convinced that so far we have been looking at training our young provenance researchers. And like I said in my statement, 
we want to go now onto the meta level so that historic contexts can be embedded and factored in somehow or another. And we can obviously expand these. That's not the problem. The problem is what Kostov Zuschlag just touched on, namely how the, we define this new access and what provenance research can contribute above and beyond simply training up new provenance researchers. We haven't had a chance to address this theoretically, but I think that's also part of our mandate without not neglecting the other area that is so important. Thank you very much. Any calls for the floors? There's one. My name is Andrea Dedling. Andrea Dedling. I am a member in the Golden Calf Memorial Group and Computer Genealogy. I do that as well. Now, I want to go from genealogy to provenance as research fields. Now, with you, you're focusing on artworks. With me, it's the descendants, the people themselves, who are at the heart of what I do. And there's a bridge here because some of the, you're looking for the descendants of the former owners of these artworks, and I'm looking for the, the well, I want to help these descendants in looking for their roots. And uh, we meet sort of halfway, perhaps. So my question to you is, where does genealogy happen in your provenance research at the university? Do you teach genealogy? This is something that, of course, is more linked to history. You have to be able to research in archives. You have to be able to read documents. You have to know how in the portals of this world you can maybe find other research groups and get into touch with people who might be able to help you. So what you talked about here in terms of portals is something where I would have to say that in the area of genealogy we're a lot further along. There's, you know, gene wikis who offer portals where you can search all of the databases that are available or connected to this. Again, I would see a bridge here to provenance research. That you're, it sounds like you're looking for a kind of portal like this that links all of the existing databases. So it'd be interesting for me to understand how you see the connection to genealogy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You're actually talking about exactly what I was referring to, the question of interdisciplinary approaches, because genealogy research isn't an integral method of art history research, and I'm sure we are not the super experts in this field. But this is an issue that I certainly think I would want to draw on the experience of experts and in a cooperation project, if we were to have a seminar or something involving museums as well, where the students could work practically and solve the provenance of artworks, for example. And then the question that comes after that is, who should it belong to today? So searching for the heirs as you discuss it. And this is why these cooperation projects are so important. As we just heard, this is why they're so important, because at the university and at the institute, we don't have, usually don't have our own collection that we can work on. So I would say genealogy is an interdisciplinary cooperation partner for us in training at the art historian research institutes. I wonder if I could just add something to that as well. I agree with what you said, but I think that at many institutions, as I've already said, provenance research is being done and has been done in the past as well, and where there already is some knowledge there, which with the help of cooperations and networks and connecting one another, we can, of course, profit. and these things can be based at the university and passed on to posterity. I think that's the real challenge facing us here. That's why we're sitting here, I'd say. And in the years to come, we will be very much engaged with these issues. 
There's another question over there. Yes, I've got a question about the interface to practitioners. You're all sitting here in front of the most important practitioners in conf Nazi confiscated art here, and we've got fantastic universities up on our panel here, represented through you. So are you seeking active involvement with practitioners? If we have a, a Limbach case, for example, or can the Limbach Commission, if they've got a question on provenance, can you offer supervision there? And then is, you know, l lifelong learning is an issue. I'm a lecturer. I uh, teach at three universities. And this lifelong learning is something I have seen primarily in a postgraduate function. Our university is also thinking about training us in block seminars. That's a question to Mr. Vela and Mr. Zuschlag. Thank you very much. And the response has to be a simple one, yes, in the following manner. Mr. Zuschlag touched on this a bit. In the postgraduate area, we are planning a master's on provenance research, focusing pretty much on the legal side of the equation. The legal element will be certainly open for people who are coming from law and want to get more involved in provenance and art history. So I would say there is already something there in the pipeline, which is interdisciplinary, a postgraduate program. And so I'm tempted to conclude by just responding with a simple affirmative, yes. And I would like to add a cordial no, an emphatic no, but just for discussion strategic reasons. No, it's, it is really true, as Mr. Vela has said, yes, of course, yes. But what I'm not going to do, and I've already been asked, you are not going to get any kind of expert report from me for any special case. No way, Jose. The independence of the university professors must be maintained, and I hope you will understand that if we cannot intervene on behalf of the university, we can't do it one way or the other. So as long as I live, you will see that I will never ever do this. However, what I would definitely decidedly want to do and do is to have contact with practitioners. Even if I've got a green button fixed term, even though I'm actually a permanent contract, but I'm a, in the working group of the provenance research, the provenance research working group, it's important to be connected with the colleagues out there. That's really important. And one of the first things we did in our, in our office was to set up a network of people, an informal network at the universities in Germany of colleagues who are involved in this issue, rep also augmented by the head of the representatives of the German Lost Art Foundation and the Provenance Research Working Group. So of course there's an ethical and economic environment in which we work, but we decidedly do this from on behalf of the university and we have to have the freedom to research independently as set out in the German basic law. And I adhere to that. My name is I'm Katrin Stoll. I'd like to say something about what we've been talking about here, further development and perspectives, not just to the panelists, but also to the German Lost Art Foundation and other organizations. We've heard so much, but like the Working Group on Provenance Research, I don't see my issue covered here. Collaborators and profiteers is my working group, and we all work in an interdisciplinary way. So it's business, art history, history, there's a legal component, and the art trade. So what I'm missing here is the center that we've just heard here. I'm not seeing our needs represented. So I'd like to have Washington 2 nil. All of us who are here in this room all of us with our initiatives, with, with our meetings and exchanging ideas. I've heard in Bonn and Professor Villa, and in Hamburg they meet, in Cologne you all meet, Dr. Berkin meets there. What I would like to see is that we say today we're going to look forward. We've looked back 20 years of Washington. That's where we are now. What do we do now? What are the things we would like to see happen? What has not been dealt with properly? And I have to say that my entire archive for 10 years, I'm the only one 
who is carrying out provenance research in my art trade. I've got 150,000 data sets that I've put online, working with Michael Hopp in the, and Uwe Hartmann and Leo Weidinger, because we, work, we have a collaboration with Austria too. We have a project there. Without this work, Lemle would never have been able to claim restitution. We have to create trust. We have to reach out to the art trade, and we have to be able to reject unjustified claims. We have to create a legal basis. I don't know if you can imagine, 20 years ago, Google was set up. When I started, we had photographs. There wasn't much literature. You know, there was Perestroika, Glasnost, the unification of Germany. Lots has happened, and all we have is this tiny little area. And I have to go from auction to auction, digitizing things, keeping everything up to date. It's such a challenge. There are so many issues that are coming up that we still need to tweak and optimize, you know, the 45 ratifying states, but also we in Germany, because we have the federal system here. What I would like to see is that we really say we are going to tweak Washington and involve new groups of interest and art trade and the private collections, the private archives in all of this, because we're not going to get anywhere without them. <laughs> Ms. Stoll, thank you very much for your flaming appeal for more dialogue, among other things. And this statement, in a sense, takes us out of the university and provenance research and restitution focusing on universities. We don't have that much time, but I think that we've managed to at least touch on certain issues, and uh, quite rightly, we have asked the question of the specific implementation of the Washington principles at the universities, quite rightly so. Just as Markus Brechtchen also said, the freedom to research independently, which is a bit of a balancing act between the political will, the academic abilities, but constraints too. These are all things that we would need to debate for further. Like I said, we just touched on these issues, but I'm aware of the time. And there is a chair over there in the sitting down. It's quarter past one. I'm sure we're all hungry, and we all need a lunch break. So let me just say thank you very much for listening, for your interest, and I wish us all an interesting afternoon. Thank you very much. So enjoy your lunch, and 2.30 will continue.